she said if I ever needed any assistance of anybody out there in California, I was welcome to call her. And this uh, individual, Jody Arias, that we've been talking about, <coughs> is she in court today? Yes, she is. Tell me where, he, where she is seated and what she's wearing. Uh, she's over there in a black long sleeve uh, shirt. Is she at the end of the table? Yes. Your Honor, may the record reflect the identification of the defendant? Yes. So after that, did you continue having contact with her or not? Yes. Uh, it, I, I don't believe we spoke for maybe three or four weeks after the convention. Um, I think we, we did a, a kind of a, a party for Utah before one of our big events. Um, and I think we were, we were actually playing pool with a friend of ours uh, named Zion Lovinger. And Zion, uh, somehow Jody's name came up and asked me uh, if I knew who, her, who she was or how we had known each other. And um, eventually he uh, maybe kind of played matchmaker a little bit and got, uh, you know, we talked about it. And then I ended up giving her a call, I think, even that night at that event. And how much time elapsed between the time that you met her and the time that you actually placed this call? Probably three or four weeks. And when you called her, did she, what did she say? Um, I asked her if she remembered who I was. Uh, she said yes. Um, and it just was, a, it seemed like a pleasant conversation. It went on for maybe 30 minutes before an hour maybe. And, and during the time that you and she spoke, was there an agreement or an indication that you were going to call her back? She was going to call you back? What was sort of, how was that conversation ending? Um, just, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if we necessarily agree, but I think we probably talked the very next day. And did this sort of continue on where you continued to talk and that sort of thing? Yeah, from that point, I, I mean, we, we probably talked at least three or four, sometimes five times a week. Um, either she would call me or I'd call her, usually around 10 or 11 at night when our days were kind of done. Did there come a time where uh, the two of you agreed or she agreed to come out and visit you? Uh, yes. What was the name of the town that you were living in back then? Salt Lake City. Um, is Salt Lake City near West Jordan? Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it's a suburb. Mm -hmm. And were you living in Salt Lake City or in West Jordan? West Jordan. And when you say West Jordan, who describe the living arrangements back um, then? I, uh, back then, I actually lived in a, a kind of a side apartment with my family, and and that their house was in West Jordan. Did that side apartment have its own entrance? Yes. Or, and did it have its own kitchen? Mm -mm. Is, that, is that a no? No, no, I'm sorry. No, it didn't. Um, so there's this sort of agreement that she's going to come out. Do you know about when you guys reached this agreement that she was going to come out? Um, it would have been uh, the end of May. And um, do you know how she was, what her itinerary was when she was going to come out there? Um, I can't remember for sure. It seemed like she was going to be on a road trip or she was just going to come out and see me directly. I, I don't really remember, um, but I, she, she was going to come out um, and just spend one day because uh, she would be, uh, have to get back to work. So she was going to come out um, she, probably about a week from the time we originally talked about her coming. Did she tell you what route she was going to take to visit you? I think she had a friend that had a, a baby that was born or something. She wanted to visit her friend. Um, uh, if I understand it right, she lived in Northern California, so she was going to drive down to LA first, a area, LA area, and visit that friend, and then from there she was going to come and see me. And are you familiar how to get from the LA area up to uh, Salt Lake City, Utah area? Yeah, it's I-15 freeway the whole way. And when you spoke to her about this particular trip and her itinerary, what day of the week was she supposed to arrive to see you? Um, I believe it was, uh, um, I think it was Wednesday. It's, that's the time that we normally have our training. Um, okay. And I think she was gonna be there on Wednesday morning is when she had said. We talked at the, the, the night before, um, maybe around nine or 10 at night. Okay, so you talked the night before around nine or 10 at night. Mm -hmm. And the expectation was that she was going to be there the next day, which was a Wednesday, around what time? Um, I, I knew it was about a 12-hour drive. A little concerned about her driving overnight because it's 9 p.m. Um, she said she'd be fine and she'd obviously pull over just to be safe. She needed to take a nap or something. So 12-hour drive, I would expect her maybe at 9 um, if she would drove straight through. But, of course, probably she wouldn't drive straight through. So I think thought maybe 
around 12 or 1, I was kind of expecting her to be there. All right. So the next day, which was the Wednesday around 9 o'clock, did she arrive up there? No. And uh, you talked something about training that day. What, what are we talking about when you say training? Uh, associates get together, kind of learn uh, more about the membership and, and how, you know, how the service is again, and serve families and things like that. And so we come together on a training on Wednesday night. And so and I think she was even going to attend that training with us. What time was the training on Wednesday night? Uh, training was 7 p.m. And where, would the train, where was the training scheduled to take place? Uh, in Sandy, Utah, which is about 10 minutes uh, south of West Jordan. And did you, attain, uh, did you attend that training that Wednesday? Yes. So it's, it's 10 o'clock, noon. Did she arrive by noon? No, no. Um, and at noon, mm -hmm. I was obviously concerned because she's driving throughout the night. Um, and I, I tried to call her at 9, but her voice, her phone went straight to voicemail, so I couldn't get through. Um, tried to call again at noon. Um, and I wasn't too concerned at 9. At noon or 1 when I didn't get a hold of her, um, at that point I was a little concerned. Um, but it still was just going straight to voicemail. And no, it was just going straight to voicemail. Every yeah, time. I wasn't ringing. All right, go ahead. And how many tries did you give it, let's say, you know, after 1 o'clock in the afternoon to, to reach Maybe two, or more, two more times. Uh, I also contacted another friend that I think she was going to visit while she was there, um, uh, Mark and Leslie Udy. Uh, I, and Leslie seemed to know her a little bit better than I did. I talked to her for five minutes at the convention, and then I talked to her a lot on the phone before she came on. It came over for about a month and a half. We'd have, you know, a lot of conversations throughout the week, but um, she, uh, Leslie Udy seemed to know her a little bit better. And uh, so I, I asked Leslie if she had heard from her or if possibly she knew her number to her grandparents or whoever uh, it was that she was living with and maybe see if she was okay. Were you successful after this call to Leslie Udy in uh, receiving a return call from the defendant? No, no. Uh, and at, so when we couldn't get a hold of her, I had just hoped that maybe she could figure out where our training was and so I thought maybe she, I'd, I'd see her at the training. So you went to the training and you said that started at 7 o'clock, correct? 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. And you hadn't heard from her at that point, right? No. So the training lasted for how long? Two and a half hours. So that would place you at what, 9.30 in the 9 evening? 9.30, mm -hmm. Where did you go after that training? Um, at that time, we had a few of our buddies. Every week we'd go over to the Cheesecake Factory um, and uh, we'd just hang out. We'd grab a drink, sometimes uh, grab an appetizer or something. We'd just sit there and chat. Um, yeah, so that's where we go. And while you were at the Cheesecake Factory, which would have been after 9.30, right? Yeah, nine, yeah it, we got there probably about 10 p.m. And while you were there at the uh, Cheesecake Factory, what town is that in, that Cheesecake Factory that you went in? Um, uh, Murray, which is maybe 10 minutes uh, east of West Jordan. And when you were there, did you receive a call from the defendant? Yes. About what time? Was that Maybe um, we had talked about it a little bit. Uh, I knew that she knew some other people at the table, uh, like uh, uh, Mike Ratat uh, was was there. Um, but but you received the call from around 10:30 p.m. Right. And what did she say to you when she called? Um, I mean, obviously, first I just said, you know, Jody, and um, you know, uh, she said, hey, and and she almost sounded apologetic from the get go, and. I just said, hey, are, are you okay? And then uh, she said, yes, I'm fine. And I just asked her, uh, you know, where she's been, you know. And and how so you asked her where she's her. been. What did she tell you that she'd been? Um, she said a few things happened. For one, I think she said um, she's kind of airheaded like that, and she took the wrong freeway, and she drove the wrong direction for many hours. And then at some point she got tired, and so she fell asleep, and she couldn't believe how long she slept by the time she woke up. And I just said, okay, well, good. I'm just glad you're okay. I couldn't get through to your phone. And when, when I asked, when I said that, she told me that she had lost her car charger. She hadn't forgot to bring it, maybe pack it. And so her phone had been dead all day. If, her, if she'd forgotten the charger and her phone had been dead all day, mm -hmm. how was it that she was then able, able to call you from that same phone? She actually called for speculation. I, I think she told sustained me. Sustained rephrase. Mm -hmm. Did she tell you something about that? Uh, she told me that um, she had, uh, I think, bought it from a gas station or something she found. found so she told you she bought another charger, right? Right. And how long did this conversation last? Um, I could be wrong, but maybe 30 minutes to an hour. And It could be longer. I'm not sure. 
during that time that you were talking to her, was there ever an indication as to when she was going to, did you and she talk about when she was going to arrive in the Salt Lake City area? Yeah, it seemed like she was still like a long ways away. She wasn't sure exactly where she was at, so she didn't, we didn't know exactly how long it was gonna take her to get there. So she had to kind of get her bearings. So um, she told you she didn't know where she was, right? Right. Then, and what else did she say? Um, I remember at some point, and I don't know if it was this conversation or if I had, we disconnected for a couple hours and then she called back, I really can't remember, but at some point um, I went into my, the living room where my father was and I asked him what freeway should she take at this point where she's at. And so he also knew that she was coming and um, I, I don't even remember where she said she was, but it seemed like a pretty simple answer. And then it seemed like she could have been maybe seven or eight hours away at that point. Uh, it still took her another 12 hours to actually get to my house. So she called that evening and then you have this call around up to 11 o'clock. Maybe, yeah. And after that, she may have called one other time, right? Is that what you're telling me? Yeah, yeah. maybe. I, yeah, it's hard to remember now. And then after that, did you receive another call late in the evening or not? Was there any other contact with her? Uh, no, not until the next morning. Did she know how to get to your house? Did, had you given I her think I, Yeah, she must have had my address or something. She, she, yeah, she knew how to get to my house. She had so, never been there before, but she knew how to get there. And what time did she get there to your house? Um, again, not sure, but maybe around 10 or 11 the next day. I'm not positive on that. And that would have been the Wednesday, right? Uh, that would have been Thursday now. That was Thursday then. And she was supposed to get there Wednesday. Yeah, so this is 24 hours after I was originally expecting her. And did you have any plans for lunch during that? Uh, that I had an appointment, and so I'm, I'm not really clear of how this happened, but I know that she followed me to the appointment. Um, so I, we, but let me stop you there. Where was this appointment? And what was it at a place called you? Jim's Restaurant. It was less than a mile from my house. And what was the purpose of the appointment? I had an associate on my team who had another gentleman who felt like he had some connections, uh, some people who could use our help from our company. And so uh, we arranged the time for me to go and meet with him and do a presentation. What time uh, was the meeting scheduled for? Could have been 11 or 12, I'm not positive. So she arrives before that meeting, right? Yes. After she arrives there, does she stay a long time there at your house in West Jordan or not? I don't remember anything before that event. And that, that meeting might have been the first time we actually, I think she came straight to that sit down with me because right. of the time she was showing up. And then she actually was with me during that sit down. All right, so she was there during the meeting. Then, yes, right? yes, she actually followed me in her car there. Um, as you, how far away was the meeting in terms of travel from your house to the restaurant? How far was it? A mile. And on the way from your house to the restaurant, you say you're driving your own car. Is that what mm -hmm. you said? Yeah. Is she driving her own car? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yes, and yes, she was for sure. So she's driving her car, and as you're driving to this place, uh, does something happen? Uh, we get pulled over by a police officer. When you say we, did you get pulled over too? Um, no, I was in front of her, um, so the police officer, her car was behind mine, police officer was behind hers. And who did he pull over, both of you, her or you? Jody. And what did you do when the police officer pulled her over? Just sat there, looked in my rear view mirror at them talking to each other. And how far from your house, or how much had you traveled before she was pulled over? 700 yards, <laughs> I mean, you pretty much got pulled over right away. And after you're watching in the rear view mirror, what are you seeing? Um, he's talking to her. Um, and eventually, it didn't look like he gave her a ticket or anything. Why do you he say that? Because I didn't see him hand her anything. Maybe he gave her a warning. I'm not sure. I was trying to figure out if she got a ticket or not. But I didn't really find out the story, I don't believe, until we went to the restaurant. I might have got out and talked to her there. I don't think so. I think we went over to the restaurant before I got the story of what happened. Okay, so you went to the restaurant and you had the story. What was the story that she told you? Um, she said it was a funny story. Um, you know, he pulled her over because her back license plate was upside down. Um, and then um, I asked her what, how that would happen. And I think, uh, I think she had, what, what, what she told me is she um, was coming out of a Maverick or a restaurant or something like that. And where, where, what? Sometime on her trip to get to my house. All right. 
And when she came out, there was these kids that were goofing around at the front of her car with her front license plate. And when they saw her, they were laughing. They dropped the license plate and took off. And she told me she thought that was the only thing they did. So she just took that license plate and put it in her back seat or maybe put it back on. I'm not, I don't remember. Um, but she thought that that's all they did. But uh, what she told me is that apparently they also switched my back license plate and turned it upside down. And um, so that's why the police officer had pulled her over. So we laughed about it and that was it. Uh, do you know whether or not you helped her um, reaffix the license plate right side up? I honestly don't know. I think I might have fixed it for her, but I, I, can't, I can't remember. So then uh, you go to this meeting, the meeting com is completed and she's there, right? Is what you told us. Yeah, and she's at to sit down with me probably around 11 or 12. After that, where did the two of you go? We went back to my, my house. Okay, and uh, when you go back to your house, what did the two of you do? Uh, we talked for a while. I think we agreed that we were going to watch a movie or, or something like that. Um, and and that, that's what we did. We, we turned on a movie. And what happened during the movie? At some point, I mean, we were talking and, and, and we kissed. And did this kissing continue or did it just stop at one kiss? Uh, eventually we kissed probably many times. Every time we, we uh, started kissing, it got a little more escalated. And with regard to the physical contact beyond the kissing, was there any of that? Um, clothes never came off. Um, you know, at some point uh, she was kissing my neck, I was kissing hers, um, but clothes never came off. How about your hands? Yeah, my hands were, uh, I never touched her breasts or anything like that. Uh, at one point I had my hands on her, her, her thighs. She was, um, you know, things were, she was definitely seemed uh, to be into the moment and, um, you know, eventually we, we stopped. Before you stopped, did your hands ever go near her vaginal area? Yes. When you say that you stopped, at any point did she say to you, we need to stop, or how was it that it came I don't think really in either one of us had said, please stop. We both just stopped. I mean, part of our, our conversations with each other uh, were about uh, her religious views and my religious views, and I didn't want uh, her to regret her trip. You know, there, I didn't want that to happen, so, um, you know, at some point we stopped, but it wasn't necessarily her stopping me or me stopping her. We just... I don't want to go any further for her to regret the trip. During this um, interlude that you are having, um, what was her de demeanor? Was she upset? Was she happy? What, what was her demeanor? Um, I mean, it just seemed like the person I'd be talking on the phone, um, just meeting her in person. I, I never, there was never a moment where it felt awkward or anything like that. At any time while this was going on, did she grab your hands and say, don't put it here, don't put it there, anything like that? Mm. Is that a no? No, no. And um, so later on, what did the two of you do? Um, later on, we had, I don't know if anything else happened before this, but we had to get to the, the business briefing. And where was the brief business briefing? Sandy again, same location. That was the training the night before. And uh, what time was the business briefing? Um, the business briefing was at 7 p.m. And so you, you get back probably around one, so it's one to seven that you and she are together, correct? Mm -hmm. Is that yes? Uh, I'm, we, yeah, yes. so one to seven we're together, yeah. And did you finish watching the movie that you guys I watched? don't know. I don't know if we did. So what happens uh, with regard to the business briefing? Do you go by yourself or do you go with No, we, we go together. Um, I think she drove with me. I think I was just going to take her back to her car. She might have followed me there. I, I, I don't remember that. Um, but we, we showed up definitely together at the same time. And um, she, uh, obviously people were surprised to see her, her there. Uh, many people knew, a few people knew who she was and obviously um, knew she was from California and asked her, you know, said hi and what she's doing in town. Um, with regard to her hair color, when you met her, what was her hair color? Uh, blonde. When she came over to West Jordan, uh, what was her hair color? Uh, dark, dark um, brunette. Brunette. Yeah. And during the time that you and she are alone in the afternoon, did you notice her hands? Um, yeah. And did you notice whether or not she had any injuries or cuts to one of her hands? Uh, she had two small bandages, it seems like, on one of her fingers, uh, or her, a couple of her fingers. Did you and she talk about that? Yeah, yeah, either, either then or, yeah, we did at some point, yes. And what did she tell you about the, those cuts? She worked at Margaritaville. 
Um, and I guess she broke a glass and she cut her finger. Well, I'm not asking you to guess. I'm asking you to tell me what she said. I, oh, okay. I, we know that you weren't there and you don't know. I'm just telling you what she, she told, told me. She worked at Margaritaville and she had cut her finger. And how did she cut her finger at Margaritaville? I think uh, she told me she broke a glass and cut her finger. So you go to this training and how long does this training last? Uh, about an hour. And One then hour. what happens after that? We get a whole bunch of buddies again, and we go out to Chili's, and you know that's that's what we went over there and talked for probably two and a half, two hours, two hours, two and a half hours, something like that. At any time during this half evening, was she? What was her demeanor like? Was she crying at any time? Was she upset at any time? What was her demeanor like? Uh, I mean, the only time, I mean, she was fine. She was laughing about simple little things, just like any other person. She was. I never once felt there was anything wrong about the day. I felt like um, socially, the first time I ever saw her in a crowd, um, I thought she was a much uh, she was she was much more comfortable one on one. Um, that was the first time I noticed she was a little awkward in in social areas, and it seemed like she didn't um, talk very much to some other people. Uh, and some other people would talk about that a little bit, but it just wasn't the Jody I knew because one on one she was um, very talkative and insightful and. So Very seemed, different. So it seemed like in social, social situations, she was a bit more inhibited and shy. Yeah, a little shyer, yeah. Mm -hmm. And with you, she, that's not how she was when you were alone with her, right? Not at all. Um, did she leave then to go back, or did you guys make it back to your place? Uh, we made it back to my place. About t what time was that? Late or um, 11, maybe. And when you got back, what did the two of you do? I think we turned on a movie again. Maybe it was the same one we were watching. Maybe it was a different one. But uh, we we were tired. We fell. Uh, she she had to get back to Margaritaville. That was why she couldn't come quarreling with us the next day. Um, she almost was going to stay with us, and everybody was you know asking, you know telling her to. Um, but uh, she seemed to think about it. Um, but it, it got to a point where she felt like no, she couldn't. She's got to get back to work. And so we left. But sometime as we left, she said she don't have to leave right now. And so I said, well, you, we can go back to my place again if you don't want to leave right away. And so I went back to my place and uh, we took a nap. All right. And um, when you awoke, describe for me what happened. Um, I don't know how long we were sleeping. The second we woke up, we were, we were kissing. And what else happened? Um, uh, she got on top of me um, pretty aggressively and, and we were kissing. When she got on top of you pretty aggressively, where was her genital area compared to yours? I mean, she was right on top of me. And you guys were kissing, correct? Mm -hmm. Is that yes? Yes. And how long did this encounter take? Maybe a few minutes. And during that time, was there a decision to go forward or a decision to stop? We, we just stopped. And you partly made that decision, correct? Mm -hmm. Is that yes? Yes. Uh, at any time did she say stop, don't go forward, don't do anything else, anything like uh, that? Neither one of us did. We just, it was kind of the same feeling I had. I, yeah, I just, we, we just stopped. Anything about her demeanor um, that indicated to you that she was upset about anything at that point? Not at all. In terms of you were around her for that day, did you form an opinion based on your contact with her and being around her as to her strength and how fit she was. She, she's very fit. <clears throat> you said what? She's very fit. She was in good shape. And in terms of her strength, did you form an opinion based on that night? We were um, instant messaging back and forth. We went up at some point, I, I complimented her on being very feisty and was kind of referring to she's, she's a lot stronger than she looks. Um, you've during this encounter, when after you wake up, um, did she ever, and the phrase may have been, adjust you in, in any way um, while this encounter is going on? Well, that, that's what I mean. When we woke up, we were kissing, and then she eventually kind of grabbed me and adjusted me a little bit, and that's when she got on top of me and we were kissing. And did that, were you able to feel her strength at that point? Yeah. And. Did you form an opinion, as, again, throughout the day and as part of that, as to her strength? Yeah, she's strong. Um, at any point, um, did you 
ever kiss her stomach? Yes. And were you able to see her stomach in terms of whether or not she was in shape? Yeah, close to a six pack, yeah. You said it was close to a six pack? That's what she was even talking about in our MSN or our instant messaging through Google. Yeah. And after you stopped, what happened? Did she stay or did she go? Or what happened? Yeah, I mean, at that point, uh, I kept on reminding her she had to get to work. That's what she was telling people at the, the dinner, and that was kind of the whole reason she had to go. And um, uh, she said she wanted to stay just a little while longer, and we stayed a little, maybe a few more minutes is all. And then um, just kind of walked her out to her car and, um, and said goodbye. What time was that? Any idea? 12, 1 p.m., 1 a.m. possibly. It was later. Right. Could even be later than that. I don't remember. One of the things that uh, you indicated to me was that there was this sort of instant messaging part of, or component of your relationship. Y yeah. Yeah, we would talk, and every once in a while, um, if I noticed she was online or if she noticed I was online, uh, we both had a Google account, I believe. And so you can kind of tell when they're on, and so you can just kind of write a little message and... <laughs> You know, a few of our conversations were through that. Describe for me how that's different, if, if you know, from emailing, in other words. Um, I mean, it pops right up on the screen if you've got your Gmail open. And so if somebody says, you know, hi, it pops right up and you can reply and then you can almost carry on a conversation while you're doing other things. Um, but I mean, it's kind of like a text message back and forth. It's immediate and you're both responding right away. And sometimes you're even responding to things that are two or three questions away, you know, so it can kind of be kind of confusing. Let me uh, show you exhibit number 284. Go ahead and take a look at it. Are you familiar to, with, to who that is sent? Uh, yeah, this is from Jody Arias and on who, May 30th. And who's it sent to? Me. And it has, without reading it, it has something on it, right? Something written. Okay. Yeah, what she wrote me. Uh -huh. right. I can have that back. Move for the admission of exhibit 284. No objection. Action. 284 is admitted. If you look at your computer there, I think it'll pop up for you. Yes, I see it. And this is from her to you, and what does she say in this message dated May 30th of 2008 at midnight, well, 1221 AM? Hmm. Uh, it says, uh, hey there, handsome, this is a test. The fact that it says this is a test does do you know whether or not this is the first contact that you had via this uh, messaging system? Yeah, it could have been. I don't, I don't remember being too familiar with using it too much before this. Yeah. And you didn't send this though, right? No. Take a look at the uh, exhibit. Well, let me show you another. Take a look at it. Yeah. Is it the same sort of message and it's between you and her? Yeah, it's just, uh, this one's on 623. All right. I move for the admission of exhibit 287. I'm going to object, Jarno. When we approach, you may. 287 is admitted. It indicates it's uh, from you to Jody Arias, right? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, in reading this, it, it appears that it says at the top, but it's always great to hear from you uh, when that says me, and then directly underneath that it says Ryan's PPL. Mm -hmm. Are you me or Ryan's PPL? I'm Ryan's PPL. And in terms of reading it, 
it does say that it's always great to hear from you. You do the same, referring to something, right? Yeah, but I mean, the conversation looks like it starts at the bottom, like so, it goes the other way. So it that's would the be, last thing that was said. So it would actually read, if we're going to read this conversation, her saying to you, hey, hottie biscotti, what's new, right? Yeah, that's what it, that probably would have been the first. Is, is Hadi Biscotti a pet name she gave you, or is that just something that's in this text message or message? I didn't. I, she might have said it a few times. I, I don't remember her calling me that on a regular basis. And then it says Ryan's PPL says, hey, you, what's? Probably what's up. I just didn't type it. You're not really spell checking yourself as you're going through this. And then me, which would be her, says, actually, I'm just running off to work. And you responded with what? Okay, have a great day. And then what did she respond? She said, you do the same, but it's always great to hear from you. There were other such conversations between the two of you, right? Yeah. Was there a, a conversation that took place in which she discussed the breakup with uh, Travis Alexander? Not too often, but we talked so much that, yeah, I mean, a few times we talked about it. And take a look at Exhibit 286 and see if you recognize it and whether or not that's a conversation where she talked about the breakup. Um, yeah, this is a few days after she was, um, we were together in West Jordan, and we did talk about yeah, we, we did talk about the breakup here, a little bit about some of the things that happened, and yeah. Okay. I move for the admission of Exhibit 286. There's not going to object again, same objection. Please pray. Exhibit 286 is admitted. Sir, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, parts of Exhibit 286. This is page two of nine. We see the me is who? That's Jody. And the Ryan's PPL is who? It's me. Me does indicate something there. Why don't you read to us what that sentence or that whole section says? You want me to read it or just say what I No, remember? just whatever it says, starting with anyway. Uh, anyway, back to Travis real quick. And this is Jody. Anyway, back to Travis real quick. He's a great person, and I wouldn't want to, to edify him as anything else. We all have our character flaws. We've seen each other at our absolute worst uh, and our best. We are just fundamentally different. This is page four of nine. If you start reading with me from the bottom and read up for me. Um, from me where you're pointing? Is, me is Jody Arias, correct? What, you want me to start on well? No, uh, where it says, yes. Uh -huh. Well, there is a little more. What is Laugh it? out loud, LOL. Laugh out loud. Um, the whole time we were seeing each other after we broke up, he had another girlfriend. Um, I had no idea he didn't tell me ab uh, about her here, but her probably until after they broke up. Oh, oh, let me uh, see if I can get this uh, to focus in a little bit. There you go. That's better. Okay. Um, but I felt so bad this time I was the other girl. I wanted to tell her, but that would have caused a lot of unnecessary drama and pain. Uh, anyway, since she asked what time it was, I decided to text her back quote, time to cuddle with Jody, good night. Then I deleted the message, went to sleep, and never mentioned it to him. Let's continue on. What did you say? I said, oh man, that, that is intense. And she responded. But it got to the point where I, could, I, I couldn't keep it in anymore. I confronted him. We broke up, and ki I kind of wish that that was the end of the story. But it is a very, but he is a he is very persuasive, and we continue to see each other, even though we were no longer boyfriend girlfriend. So she talks about 
this text message and what she did with it, right? Yeah. As part of her coming out there, did she, did you and she continue on talking about what it was that you might do when she came out there to see you? Before she came the first time? Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, we talked about maybe watching a movie, uh, going on a hike. Uh, I mean, we just mentioned some things that she can do while she was out here in Salt Lake. Take a look at uh, 285. Does this sort of summarize your conversations regarding what you, the two of you might do? Um, yes. Uh, this is, yeah, before she came. I move for the admission of Exhibit 285. And this is page three of nine. Read the part that says, me. Then while we were in Huntington Beach, he fell asleep and a tech message came through from a girl that said, sorry, I didn't get back to your last text. What time is it there? I, uh, I tried, oh, okay, and then up. So of course, I read the last text he, ha he sent her and it said, I really miss you, gosh, I'm making myself look so bad. This is still her. I had a really strong gut feeling. I'm not saying I'm psychic, but I've been cheated on twice before, and it's a very distinct feeling, one that I, can't, uh, I cannot ignore. So I asked him gently about it, and he got really angry, and it led to an argument. Uh, he said I was crazy to think that, so I left it alone. But the feeling persisted, and one day while he was taking a nap, I took his phone and read his text messages. Bad, I know. And exhibit number 285, for example, um, you talk at the bottom about getting sushi and that sort of thing, but basically it just talks about what your plans are when she comes out, correct? Yeah, she had said that about getting sushi or something. Did you and she also text message each other back and forth? Yeah. I don't have any other questions, thank you. Cross-examination. A moment, Your Honor. <clears throat> How you doing? Let me start out today. I want to talk to you a little bit. I think what you told us was that you met Miss Arias in Oklahoma City. That's right. Okay. And that was at a, um, I think you call them convention for people to go, right? Yes. Okay. And you mentioned having a conversation with her after a, a meeting or a ceremony, if I understood you correctly. Yeah, yeah, it was like a, a specific team breakout session. Okay. So it's a little bit smaller than the entire convention, it's just a closer knit team. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you began to talk to her after that. Do you remember how long that conversation was? It, it couldn't have been more than a few minutes. It was quick, quick. I, yeah, didn't have spend a whole lot of time we were going okay. to and from. And what were your initial impressions of Jody at that time? Um, she was nice, uh, beautiful. That's what I remembered about her. Okay. Um, at this point in time at this convention in Oklahoma City, and I, it, it was April 2008, is that, was that was your recollection or thereabouts? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, did you know a man by the name of Travis Alexander? Uh, yes. <coughs> I knew who he was. I didn't know him personally. Okay, so could you kind of describe that for us, what you mean by that? 
Yeah, I um, maybe three months in the business, uh, I was struggling, not doing so well. I, I was even thinking about quitting. Um, and then at some point, Travis Alexander was flown into town as a guest speaker for Salt Lake City Market. And I attended that at training and I was inspired by him. It kind of changed my, my business around and that was my only encounter with him personally. Okay. And so I just, uh, I kept going and did much better after that. Okay. Now you also mentioned that sometime subsequent to this uh, initial meeting with Ms. Arias, by the way, was Mr. Alexander there when the two of you were speaking that during that initial session? I don't know. I don't remember him, so probably not. Okay. Being there. All right. And as, as someone who was important to you, that you probably would have remembered that. I probably would have recognized him. Yeah, probably. I mean, right. I, I know I, I know he was at the event, but not that specific event when me and her were talking and exchanged numbers. Okay. Gotcha. And you mentioned something. I believe it was a it was a smaller team get together. Uh, mm -hmm. where a, a gentleman by the name of Zion Lovinger, did I get that correct, was there? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, that was probably about a month after convention. We were playing pool downstairs. Okay. So this was, this was after the convention was over, it was just the two of you then, is that? I, was, I mean, there was a bunch of people, and I can't remember whose house we were at, maybe Dave Hall's mom's house or something like that. Okay. Um, but it was kind of a dinner, get together with just the business people in Salt Lake and, and the, the Utah area. Okay. And um, yeah, eventually Jody's name came up and... Do you remember uh -huh. the context of her name coming up at this meeting? It sounds kind of yeah, out of place. it's been so long. I, I don't really remember if I brought it up or if he did. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, in between this initial meeting mm -hmm. and the time you, her name was brought up in uh, this, this meeting, the pool or what have you, um, was, did you have conversations with Ms. Arias? I don't think so. I think it was about a three or four week break before we really started talking after that convention. Okay. Tell me what you can recall about that conversation with, with Zion about Jody. Um, she's cool, you should give her a call, something like that. Okay. You mentioned uh, that he was trying to play matchmaker with between yeah. the two of you, I think was your words, right? Yeah, it could be an assumption, okay. but yeah, he, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. well, what did you mean by that? Um, I mean, he, he mentioned that I should call her, and I, I told her that I originally had her number, and I think I even uh, asked him for it, because I didn't have it anymore. Okay, and did you, uh, did he express the reasons why you should call her? Not really. Overruled in the answer, yes or no? Um, no, no. Okay, but something he said must have motivated you to call her, is that yeah. accurate? Okay. Mm -hmm. And just so we're clear, uh, you were single at this time back in April 2008, or maybe May when you had this conversation with Zion? Yeah, okay. at that point, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last yes. part. Yes, yes. Okay. And so, did you take Zion up on his offer and did you call Miss Arias? I think if I remember right, I actually called her right there at that, that event. Okay. Because I believe the first time I talked to Jody, I was at somebody else's house. It seems like I even found it. Yeah, there was a, a room that had a sitting room and I think I, everybody was kind of off this way and I started talking to her and I actually went and sat in, the, in that room where there was nobody at and we started talking and we talked for quite a while. Okay. Seemed to hit it off pretty quick. Okay, do you remember how long quite a while was? Uh, could be 30 minutes. You could tell me it was three hours. I, okay. I wouldn't remember at this All point. Right. Fair enough. But you remember it being a pleasant conversation? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, was your... Thinking of how to put this. Was your interest uh, romantic, if you will? I mean, sure. I was interested in, in getting to know her her better and possibly dating her, yeah. Okay. Um, so what do you remember about that conversation? I mean, just other than it was pleasant. Um, we talked about the same kind of books that we'd like to read. I mean, um, uh, Atlas Shrug, Think and Grow Rich, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And she kind of had just had a lot of the same interests. She was a very good conversationalist on the phone. She, um, we just had a lot in common. 
Um, when I initially met her, I mean, she's a, uh, a businesswoman at a national convention entrepreneur, so I thought that was an attractive trait. Okay. Just, yeah, just all those kinds of things that sounded like somebody I wanted to get to know. Okay. And everything in that <coughs> conversation, nothing dissuaded you from your, your, the, your initial feelings, right? No. Okay. You also mentioned, and I think this might be a good point to talk about, you mentioned the fact that um, in crowds, she was a bit of a shy girl, but in private, it was different. Very different. Okay. And I just wanted to, because it sounds like after the convention, when you first met her, you didn't see her in person again until June of 2008. Is that correct? Right. Yeah, that's the first time we ever met was when she came on okay. that road. Uh -huh. So Outside of that thing. What I was what I was curious about, what I was asking about, and if you could explain it for us, is how did you draw that comparison? How did you make the comparison that she's a little bit different, uh, engaging in, in, mm. in conversation and, and shy in groups? Could you kind of sure? Um, I mean, just when I talked to her, it was such a brief moment there in Oklahoma when I got her number, and then when we talked on the phone, it was just one on one, me and her, and she was very easy to talk to. There was an, ever any uh, awkwardness there and I felt like I got to know her pretty well. She was funny. She, she just had a, a lot to say and a lot of insight on things. She asked a lot of questions and you know it just never seemed like there was ever a moment of awkwardness. Now when, when we got together at the briefing uh, I started noticing you know that she was a little shyer you know when she was in a crowd and you know I, I that's just something I noticed. I, I just noticed she didn't um, yeah, she just was a little shyer when she was in front of people. Okay. And this briefing that you just mentioned, that was in June of 2008. That's when she came to Utah, right? Right. Okay. That was a Thursday. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when she made, excuse me, when you made contact with her in the March, February, or excuse me, I guess May, it would have been, probably, I'm losing track of my months, April or, or, or Probably so. May or end of April could have been. Okay. When you had that contact, uh, did you have any awareness of her dating Mr. Alexander, having a relationship? Uh, no. In fact, at some point we had a conversation where she told me that they talked a couple times a week. And that actually shocked me because I'd talked to her for quite a bit of time. And I, I thought that relationship was long in the past. So when she mentioned that to me, I was kind of surprised that they were in. But then it made more sense as she explained that that was her executive director. That was the one that kind of, you know, and she ex uh, also explained that um, at times she would, she would uh, help him put in applications and stuff with the company. And, and she was working with him as him being her mentor in the business as well. Okay. So you said she had advised you that she helped him put in membership applications. Uh, yeah, I mean, she, she said a couple times a week they would talk business matters, but the relationship seemed to be far behind them. Okay. Um, did she ever mention uh, that she gave Mr. Alexander memberships so he could keep his yeah, numbers high? Yeah, I think high. she did uh, help him qualify for executive director if he was close. I don't know if she just mentioned she helped him in what way, but maybe, yeah. Okay. And you mentioned I think it might be a good time to kind of uh, – Describe you said to help him maintain executive director, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's the word you used, right? Mm -hmm. What is that? What does that mean? Could you it's a it's a level? bonus level in our company, um, and it just you get paid a lot more if you qualify for it. And so it, it, it re requires a certain number of applications that your team would process. At that time, I believe it was 75 memberships, and so if you only had 73 by the end of the month, you would still get paid director commissions, but not the executive director bonus. And so it's not a, a, a position you'd want to miss if you're close. Okay. So it is a, a – there's financial reward for being a quote-unquote executive director, It is correct? a big pay jump. In, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, you say big pay jump. Is there any way you can – I understand it's a commission-based business from what I understand anyway, I should say. Is that correct? Um, I mean, for example, my first month as a director, I made 6000 My first month as an executive director, I had my first $10,000 month. Okay. So it was a $4,000 increase for me. Okay. And would that also, apart from the, the financial rewards, which obviously you just described are significant, are there, uh, for example, status? Is there, is there, does this status allow you into certain places or certain meetings or 
could you kind of define that yeah, for us? Yeah, like an executive director banquet, for example, would might be the only thing I could think you're referring to, uh, or, or that you would get, basically you just got paid more, you know, but there would be certain uh, incentives the company would put out that would be just for the executives, and so we'd have a thousand or a couple thousand of us with us and our date or whatever that would go to uh, an executive director banquet. Okay. So, I mean, there is incentives in that way, yeah. Okay. And easier to get on the... Cancun trips and that kind of stuff, the requirements are a little less for executives. I see. Okay. Um, could you, and, and I know that uh, the state showed you some of the um, instant message conversations you had with Ms. Arias between, uh, well, not all of them, but uh, some of which were between April, May of 2008 and June of 2008. Mm -hmm. And that was one. That was one uh, medium you used to communicate, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it, you t said you made phone calls as well. You yeah. You said that night. About phone calls. Um, my business was really picking up at the time, so I think um, she was busy during the day, and she knew I was busy during the day. So if I called her, she called me. Is usually around 11 p.m. at night when we were both kind of settling down. Okay. Um, between this <clears throat> initial call you made. Uh, at, at Zion's prompting, and uh, your meeting on June 4th or mm -hmm. 5th of uh, 2008. Did you talk on a daily basis, a near daily basis? I'm it, sorry, I think I talked four over or five time. times a, uh, a week. <clears throat> Could be more, even uh, text messages throughout the day sometimes. Four or five times a week, and you text message during the day? Sometimes, yeah. And these instant message conversations that we just saw a few moments ago, um, when did those typically take place and, and how often? I don't think too often, because um, you usually would just call each other, or we'd be texting. If we were both by a computer, when you're on Gmail, you can kind of see your contacts and who's actually online. Okay. And I think at one point uh, she wrote, hi, this is a test, and then I was online and I responded back to her, and that's when we started kind of okay. just talking that way. All right. Um, in these, tell us about these conversations and what were the, the subjects you talked every day. Um, what kind of things did you um, Getting talk to about? know each other, um, you know, her likes and dislikes, she'd ask me that. She'd ask me a lot of questions like, what are your hobbies? What do you like to do? What do you not like to do? Um, uh, you what books have you read? Um, she'd ask me questions about, um, not too often, but a few times we talked about my dating history, you know, what that was like, how that happened. Do I have trust issues? Does she have trust issues? We would, we would talk about just whatever would come up. Okay. Um, you didn't have any conversations that could be characterized as phone sex? Yeah, we, we probably did. Okay. And when did those take place? Um, sometime after she was there, after that. Okay. But no, what I was specifically saying is between the time you met and the, or excuse me, the time you met in April and the time you met in June, there was none of that. Is that correct? No. Okay. Um, and let me ask you just uh, so we're clear, um, because some of it came up. Um, in April 2008 and um, June of 2008, between that period of time, did you have any moral or religious qualms against premarital sex? Um, I mean, I, ironically, it was kind of, I hadn't actually attended an LDS church for probably over a year at that time. And she would often tell me how she felt about, you know, her religious beliefs, the um, the Book of Mormon, how she felt, and, and I think that was kind of one of the, the big reasons why I didn't want her to regret her trip when she came, is because I certainly didn't want her going home feeling like she regretted her trip, or she made a huge mistake, or that she let temptation take over, and so, you know, that was one of the things that kind of made me stop, you know, when things were kind of getting uh, a little heated uh, okay. between us, and so, yeah, it was more her expressing her religious beliefs, and almost trying to bring me closer to God. 
Okay, and you, you made that comment, I think, to, uh, you know, I know you spoke to Detective Flores on, on the phone. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. And um, we spoke a, a year or so you back. You came out to Salt Lake, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's, you, said, you, you said that very thing during one of those conversations, that she, she was trying to bring you closer to God. Mm -hmm. Right, and that was the, during those phone conversations. And to your understanding, was she uh, a member of your, I guess, former church at that time? Yeah, she was. Um, yeah, she was. What they would call a convert. She was baptized later on. She wasn't grown. I don't think she, she wasn't raised in the church. But Somebody uh, introduced her to it. Okay. Do you know who that someone was? I, I've been told it was Travis. Okay, but you, she did by her or did for someone else or just gossip? No, I think she told, yeah, okay. she told me. She told okay. me in one of our conversations. Okay. And did she, she seek to get you reinvested in the church? Is that? A little bit. I mean, yeah, she'd mentioned reading my scriptures and, you know, yeah. Okay. And do you believe she was, any reason to doubt her sincerity in that effort? No. During these um, conversations that you had, um, where you're talking about the scripture and, and your relationship with God, um, did she ever talk to you about, or confide in you, I should say, that uh, she had a sexual relationship with Mr. Alexander? Yeah. Okay, tell us about that. Um, she told me that she never wanted me to say anything to anybody because she didn't want to deedify him in front of people that knew him, um, but that they did go a lot further than they should have. Uh, I don't know if I ever heard her say they had sex, but it seemed like that's what she was saying. I didn't want to ask the specific question because okay. I didn't feel like it was my business. But yes, um, at one point, um, maybe I did ask her, and yeah, I, I found out that they, um, that they had, had sex together, yeah. Okay. And you know, you used the word edify, and that came up in the text, or excuse me, the instant messages you <laughs> read a mo moment ago. Um, you know, that, that leads me to ask a question during these conversations, uh, text messages, emails, whatever mode you use to communicate, did she ever badmouth Travis? Did she ever edify him? Um, besides the conversation about um, him. Uh, cheating on her and him being unfaithful and and uh, um, she felt just not being uh, honest with her um, no in fact it I always found it quite surprising that some of the people who even after we found out which I, I believe was four or five days after Travis was killed well, we didn't know that for weeks Mr. Burns if I could let's just focus yeah, on that, that period of time okay yeah um, she never edified him before June 4th she never said bad things about him really okay I mean besides that when she said the trust issue besides that everything was he was a great guy he inspired her he was great everything okay. mm -hmm. uh, this um, trust issue and this uh, cell phone and this response to a text message from another girl you recall talking to that yeah I do remember morning? that okay um, do you know which girl um, she was referring to no idea do you know the period of time that we're talking about when she found this out? I was under the assumption it was a long time ago. I didn't know if it was six months ago or two years ago. I really didn't know. And again, I didn't, I didn't try to pry too much in that relationship. I didn't feel like that was, it just didn't, what, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know how long ago it was. Okay, fair enough. Do you recall when they broke up or did she ever advise you of that? When she became it seemed like a year ago, I was under the impression, I, th I thought, but I, I, on, it could have been two years prior. I don't remember having that conversation about when timeline. Okay. Do you know if it was the infidelity that motivated this breakup? Um, I kind of got the, I, it, from everything, she, Sir? Okay. Mr. Martinez, did you have an objection? Since there were so many people talking at once, why don't you ask the question again? And please wait. Sure. In the event there is an objection, I need to respond. Absolutely. 
Okay, Mr. Burns, there was some infidelity referenced in the instant message conversations we just saw. Do you remember that? Yeah, it seemed like she didn't trust him. I don't know if he was doing stuff with other girls besides flirting and talking to other people. Do you remember in your conversations with her, Was do you know if that was the reason that motivated them to break up? It seemed like, yeah, that was what, um, I think at one point I even complimented her and I felt like she was, full disclosure, I felt like she was telling me a lot more than she needed to and I didn't ask her to. And yeah, it seemed like the reason they broke up was because they um, didn't trust each other. Okay. During um, one of the conversations you had, uh, you made a comment that something to the effect that Travis didn't want the relationship he had, and I think you referenced it a little bit earlier today, Travis didn't want their relationship to be public. Do you recall saying that? or? Um, yeah, I think that was, um, that seemed like that was some of her frustration that it, it just it didn't seem like the relationship was going anywhere. And I think that, and that's why she told me she moved away um, because it just was, uh, she explained it was, um, it was hard to stop seeing each other when they were so close. Okay. So she moved away. And when you say moved away, do you, did she reference where she was moving to? From Arizona to California. Um, she, uh, yeah, she moved away for that. Okay. And, and I don't think you mentioned a specific city, but you mentioned when this was when she returned to uh, Northern California, correct? Yeah. And, uh, and, okay. Yeah. And this would have been when, do you recall? When she moved away from him? Yes. I wouldn't know. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when she told you about that? Um, just that was the end of it. Okay. But you or don't that she wished that was the end of it. Okay, but you don't remember when she moved. She didn't, you don't, you're saying, hey, I'm moving or anything like that. You don't remember no, I don't that. remember okay. her saying that to me. But, but I, I still want to get back to my question about uh, how Mr. Alexander didn't want their to re relationship to be public, which is something you've said in prior interviews. What did you mean by that? How did you get that impression? Uh, it just seemed like um, they were just on the way to breaking up and they kind of hooked up a few times after they had broken up. Um, you know, I think he, uh, from the, uh, the sounds of it, sounded like she wanted to move on, and it sounded like he wanted to move on. Okay, so I, I want to get, I want to, let, let me ask this a different way then. Did you ever see, and how long was this convention in Oklahoma City? Two days. Two days, okay. Sometimes three if you fly in the day before. And uh, I'm guessing the logistics of it was it's located at a certain hotel and everybody's... It's the Cox it's, Convention Center in Oklahoma. Okay. And I certainly don't expect you to have an attendance total with me, but are we talking hundreds of people, thousands of people? Uh, well over 10,000. Okay. And um, there were, were there a social event? I mean, you talked about meetings or social events, that sort of thing, correct? They, yeah, social events, parties. Um, they do training throughout the day for about eight hours, so you got two four-hour sessions then. And then um, usually after, they'd have, you know, dance parties, hanging out, all kinds of stuff going on. Okay. And it sounds to me, from what you've told us in the past, is that uh, you and Jody had a fair amount of mutual friends. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. I'm, yeah. And um, was there any interaction with yourself and those mutual friends at the convention with Jody there? No. Okay. Just me and Jody. I mean, I talk to those friends all the time there, but not with interaction with Jody. Okay. Um, did you ever see at this convention um, Travis and mm -hmm. Jody together as a couple? No. I, no. No. Okay. Did you ever 
see or hear of them together as a couple in any other forum? No, that's why when we had a conversation uh, that they had been talking twice a week, I was shocked because I thought they weren't talking to each other at all. I didn't know that. Well, talking to each other could mean a lot of different things. Sure. Does that mean does that mean dating, or did you yeah. have any sense There's of? There's speculation. I don't know. That's, that's what he thinks of me. There's your question. Did you have any knowledge of Mr. Alexander and Miss Arias spending time together back in 2008? Objection, foundation. You may answer. you may answer yes or no. No. Okay. The conversing that you referenced a moment ago, you learned that knowledge through Jody. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. A moment, Your Honor. And if I may approach, Your Honor. Mr. Burns, I'm going to hand you a copy of what's been marked as Exhibit 283. Just to refresh your recollection about what I'm showing you, uh, this was a, um, do you remember having some telephonic conversations with Detective Flores? Yeah. Okay. And that was back in the summer of 2008. Do you recall that? Yeah. Probably the middle of June, late, maybe later. I'm not sure. Okay. What I'm going to do is ask you to read um, starting at line 7 of this exhibit on page 9. Objection. Improper impeachment. And if he's giving it to him to refresh his recollection, there's no question before the uh, witness for his recollection to be refreshed about. Counsel approach, please. Mr. Burns, during the interview with Detective Flores, you had, do you recall making a comment? I'm gonna object because he's going to introduce it here, so by asking him it, if he wants him to look at it, he can. All right. Well, I'm asking for the subject matter. I'm asking a subject matter question, not for specific verbiage. Without referencing the specific statement, you may ask the question. Do you remember, recall, referencing to Sun Detective Flores that there was some discussions about people warning Jody not to date Travis because he was a ladies' man? statement about what other people are saying. Here's it. Gentlemen, we are going to take the noon recess at this time. Please be back in the designated area at 125. Please remember the admonition. Have a nice lunch. You are excused. Please stay. Yes, please stay. Please be seated. The record will show the jury has left the courtroom. Mr. Nermi, you may continue with this witness outside the presence of the jury for purposes of the objection. Mr. Burns, you made a statement in your interview with Detective Flores, um, and since we're outside the presence of the jury, you said, and, and in fact, they told Travis to, uh, they told her to stop dating Travis because they felt like he was kind of a ladies man. Do you recall that? Um, what? Yeah. Okay. And Judge, I would just be asking what he meant by that. And for what do you, okay, what do you mean, what did you mean by that? I mean, I, I think Travis had the reputation of, of just kind of being a fun flirt. And I don't know who you're referring to when I said they, I, it's five years ago, so I don't know who I'm referring to when I say they. Okay. And, I, and I'm not asking you that, I'm just asking okay. you what you meant by when you said that. Okay. That he was flirtatious. Okay. And the other comment you made uh, directly subsequent to that is that he wasn't treating her right. Do you recall making that statement? I don't remember saying that. Okay. Do you know what you would have meant by that statement? Um, prob from conversations from what Jody telling me that uh, he had talked to other girls uh, even when they were supposed to be together. That might have been what I meant. 
Judge, I, 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 as it relates to the objection, I don't know if we want to have this here in front of the witness or the argument. Mr. Martinez. With regard to that particular statement that they, that's in exhibit number 283, they told Travis to, they told her to stop dating Travis because they felt he was kind of a ladies man. And you know, who is this they person? I just don't know. Why did this they tell you this information? I don't remember saying any of that. I, I just don't remember how that conversation went. I just can't remember. Do you have any idea what the motivation was for them to be saying that? The only thing I can think of that would have given, no, no. You know, mm -mm. I don't know, I'm not asking you to speculate. Uh, where were you when you heard, when you may have heard this? Th that they shouldn't. They told her to stop dating Travis. I don't know. I don't know when I would have heard that. I don't know. I don't remember saying that. I just don't remember how that conversation was going. What were the words that were used other than your conclusion? They told her to stop dating Travis. What were the words that were used? I, I just don't, I don't remember any of that. And in terms of he wasn't treating her right when, but then they, they were telling me, you know, who are the they? that are telling you that he wasn't treating her right? I mean, it, it, I, I just, I really don't know who would have told me that. Okay. It might have been. Well, without uh, speculating. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's what I mean. I could take a guess of who I might have heard I that from. I don't know. Mm -hmm. With regard to what it was that the statement was, what was the statement that involved the treatment, his treatment of her. In other words, that he wasn't treating her right. What were the exact words? I don't know. In terms of Mr. Alexander, when uh, Mr. Nermi was asking you the questions, you said, well, he was a flirt, something like that. That was his reputation, right? Is that yes? Yes. What do you mean when you say he was a flirt? Just talk to everybody, you know, and. You know, he was flirtatious. He, I mean, he, uh, you know, um, I don't know if Clancy told me that. I don't know who told me that. I know, but what do you mean when you say that he's a flirt? I didn't know enough about him, but I just knew he, he was a flirt. Uh, and that, uh, you know, he, he was, uh, uh, I remember Clancy telling me, uh, you know, at times that, you know, he would, he just, that just was him and she was, you know, he would just flirt with everybody, just goofing around. Nobody really took it seriously. It, it seemed like, um, you know, obviously, he's just a flirt. That that's what that's oh, might have been what I meant. At least somebody named Clancy told you that he was a flirt. So that's Clancy telling you that, right? Yeah. I don't have any other questions. Mr. Nerman, anything to follow up? No, Your Honor. Just argument. I don't think is appropriate. So his reputation was based upon what others told you, is that correct? Right, I didn't know him, yeah, personally. Mm -mm. Okay, thank you. You may step down. Please return at 125. Okay. Mr. Nermy. Judge, before we have argument, I wanted to be ensured that the microphones are off. It appears he's going into the victim's room. He's going through the victim's room. That's where he has his wallet and his money for lunch. All right, we turned it all off. Okay. You may proceed. Judge, ultimately, this isn't the objection that the way I understand the state's objection, and actually perhaps it was Mr. Martinez's objection, he should explain his objection because it doesn't appear to be uh, hearsay at all, so. Okay, Mr. Martinez, your objection. It's hearsay. He's trying to introduce evidence of an out-of-court statement by somebody that they don't know even who said it. This individual does not lack Oh, this individual lacks any information as to who even told him. I know at the bench, defense counsel argued, well, it's not offered for the truth of the matter asserted. In other words, he's saying, I don't think that Mr. Alexander was a flirt. I don't think Mr. Alexander treated her badly. It's not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. If that's his position, then it's irrelevant. What difference does it make then what he was? So my objection is, is, is two-pronged. It's hearsay, and there's no foundation, and if, He's offering it not for the truth of the matter asserted, then it's irrelevant. 
however many prongs the state's objection has, uh, I, both prongs are nonsensical. It's not hearsay because we're not trying to get in a statement. Mr. Burns stated that he, Mr. Alexander didn't treat Ms. Arias right and that, that she was warned or there was a discussion that she should not date him. And throughout the examination, subsequent outside of the of view of the jury, he said, oh, that was because he was a flirt and, and that sort of thing. After Mr. Martinez took it to the extreme and put, who said this, who said that? Because keep in mind, I didn't say, did someone tell you this? Did someone tell you that? That wasn't the question. That wasn't the subject of inquiry. He goes down, breaks him down and says, well, maybe, he says, I don't know. I don't know who said this. I don't know who said that. And then after being badgered for a little while, he says, well, you know, Clancy might have said this person, Clancy might have said something about uh, this, uh, which was so far from the question. This is general reputation evidence. What he knew about his reputation, we're not saying anything about what someone said to somebody else. I, I, I did not ask him about Clancy. That's why I say it's, it's, it's nonsensical because I'm not asking about a statement to hearsay. So, you know, it's, we don't even get to truth or matter asserted because um, there is no statement. And that was the point I was making at bench. We're not even talking about anything being offered for the truth or matter asserted. So judge, I think the uh, objection is not well taken and, and should be overruled. And we should be able to uh, inquire as Mr. Burns on, on this subject matter. All right, Mr. Nermy, the question is whether or not this witness had information from individuals that he cannot now identify regarding the victim. I believe that is hearsay. I'm going to sustain the objection to that question. If you want to rephrase your question, I will hear uh, that and any objections the state may have, but I'm going to sustain the objection. I, d I believe it is hearsay and I do not believe it is relevant that some unknown third parties gave him this information. So if you want to rephrase the question, when we come back from lunch, I'll give you an opportunity to let me know what that question would be. I will give the state an opportunity to object and then we can proceed. And for the record, I'm showing the defendant the exhibit marked as exhibit 291. Could you take a look at this please, sir? Sure. Now, based on your review of that exhibit, uh, what day of the week was June, f or excuse me, what days uh, were your business briefings then? Uh, my business briefing um, was on Thursday. My training was on Wednesday. Okay, so could you tell <coughs> us numerically what days those were? Wednesday, Thursday, and um, are you talking about the first week of June? No, I'm saying numerically, what day of the week? Was it the first, the second? What day was was that business briefing? Um, every Thursday and right. every Wednesday I'm of every week. You, I'm asking you numerically, is it the, that day, that first week in June, oh, what yeah. day was your business briefing? The, the business briefing was on the 5th. Okay, and the training was on what day? The 4th. Okay, and <clears throat> your understanding, I believe what you testified to, is that Miss Arias was to arrive uh, in your in, in your area in Salt Lake uh, around June fourth, correct? For the first yes, yeah, sometime on June fourth. Uh -huh. Okay, sometime on June fourth. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what time was that? Um, and I, I, I'm forgive me, you said business briefing and meeting. I think so. Um, on the fourth, was there a uh, arrival time that I was expecting, Joe? Yeah, I knew she was leaving L.A. Um, the conversation I had when she'd be leaving roundabout was 9 p.m. the night before, 9 okay. or 10 p.m. So I was expecting her, she drove straight through, it's a 12 hour drive, she would have got to my house at maybe 10 a.m. I didn't think she would drive straight through. Um, you know, we, we talked about she could call me if, if she got tired. Okay. Um, and so obviously if she slept, then that would take a little extra time to get there. Okay, so let, let me back up then, or backing up a bit and, and looking at the calendar in front of you, um, before she ar ar arrived in your home, when you met her on mm -hmm. the 5th, I believe you testified earlier, correct? Yes. She arrived on the 5th? Okay. She did. Mm -hmm. um, the conversation you were just referencing, 
uh, in advance of the 4th. When did that take place? Um, I mean, that would have been on Tuesday night, the 3rd, maybe around 9 or 10 p.m. Okay. And during that conversation, did she tell you where she was at? Uh, I think she had already visited the family she told me she was going to in the Southern California area. Okay. And I can't remember the city. I'm thinking LA right now. For some okay, reason. fair enough. Um, and she was going to leave. Originally, the plans was she was going to go visit whoever, whatever she was going to do there, and then come see me. So I assumed she was in the LA area to come see me after okay. that. Okay, but she didn't specifically mention I'm in blank city. Uh, if she did, I don't remember okay. today. Um, did she, do you recall if she's told you I'm in Southern California? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yes. Okay. And during that conversation at 9 to 10 p.m., did she say to you, I, I, I'm going to be late, I'm not going to be there till Thursday, anything like that? No. Okay. Um, did she make any excuses? Well, I might be a little late for any particular reason. Maybe to take a nap in case she got tired. Okay. That's it. But she advised you that she was going to be there on June 4th? Yes. Okay. And it sounds to me further than from your conversation that there was at least some discussion or some acknowledgement that you were approximately 12 hours away at the time. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, did she give you any indication? I'm going to leave. I'm leaving right now, or I'm going to leave in an hour or so. Was that discussed? Or I think that's why I was under on the impression she'd be there in 12 hours, if not later. Okay. Yeah, she was leaving. Yes. Okay. And um, she arrived on the fifth. Yes. Is that correct from when yeah. I understood your testimony? Mm -hmm. And if I understood you correctly, that was around 10 or 11 in the morning. Is that mm -hmm. right? Right. Okay. And um, let me just a minute here, sir. Can I find me a book then, Your Honor? Yes. Sir, could you be so kind as to take a look at exhibits 278? 279, 280, 281, and 282. And, and please don't read them out loud. Just please tell us if you recognize uh, what they are from reading the, reviewing the content to yourself. Yeah, I do recognize them. And what are they? Uh, these are text messages um, that we text back and forth to each other. Okay. These mostly was about what I said. What you said, text messages from you? Mm-hmm. Okay. Your Honor, I would move that exhibits 278, 279, 280, 281, and 282 be moved in evidence. Objection, hearsay. Council approach. 280, 281, and 200, if I may approach again. You may. Mr. Burns, I'm going to show you again what's been marked as Exhibit 278. Could you review that to yourself again as well? Yeah. Yeah. And what is that? It's a text I sent her end of April. And uh, that was while advancing your relationship in a, at that point in time? Um, I mean, we had been talking quite a bit. Yeah. Okay. Still had never spent time with her besides the short time in Oklahoma. So in the context of this testament, text message, then you were uh, still, you were asserting or explaining your continued romantic interest in her. Is that fair to say? Sure. And if I may approach again, Your Honor. Yeah. I'm going to show you what's been marked, Exhibit 279. Mm -hmm. okay. And that would also be a text message from you to her, is that correct? Yes. yes. Okay. And that was a further continuation of that conversation where you were expressing your 
again, continued romantic interest in her. Mm -hmm. Judge, I'd move for yes. Uh -huh. yes. the admissions of Exhibits 278 and 279. All right, the objections overruled. 278 and 279 will be admitted. Why don't we start, Mr. Burns, with you said in reference to Exhibit 278, you made the comment you hadn't heard from her in a while, and you sent her Exhibit 278 uh, in an effort to kind of make contact with her. Is that correct? If I can see it, it'd make more sense. Why don't we go ahead and put this up here? You can see that on your screen. Can you see that on your screen? Yeah. Okay. Could you tell us uh, when you sent that text message? Uh, April 30th at uh, 8.03 a.m. Okay. And uh, could you read that for us? Never. Well, not until I get my good night text from my adorable girl in Cali. Okay. And that you said earlier then. Is, is that correct then from what you said earlier, that was your reaching out to her because you hadn't heard from her for a while, is that correct? I can't remember if there was a conversation before or after this text. Okay. I don't know. Okay. I'm gonna show you what's been marked uh, as exhibit two. 79. Are you able to see that on your screen? Yes. Um, can you read for us the date and time that was sent? Uh, 4.30 at 8.13 a.m. And could you read that for us, please? The whole thing or just the part you're showing me? Well, whoops, sorry. How about that? Uh, thank you, gorgeous. Good night. Was that in the same series of text messages? I mean, it sounds like it's about the same time period, yeah. Okay. Now, sir, I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit uh, 282. And this, again, from your what you said earlier, this was another text message you sent to Miss Arias. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. And if you're able to, with your screen, could you read for us uh, the day and time you sent that? Uh, May 3rd. Okay. And what time was that, sir? It says 7.09 a.m. Okay. And uh, could you read for us your uh, comment there? Just come and stay. And what was that a reference to? I, I'm sure we had talked about her coming and visiting at some point. She traveled. She seemed to travel a lot. Okay. And you wanted her to come? Sure. Okay. And sir, I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 281. And sir, I'll just show you that first part, if you could be so kind as to tell us when you sent that text message to her. Uh, May 3rd, 7.19 a.m. Okay. And just so we're clear, uh, as it relates to all these messages, we're talking 2008, because this is after you met her, correct? Y yes. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Um, and if you could be so kind as to read the uh, verbiage in that message. Um, good. So I'm getting closer to talking to you in. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, good. So I'm getting closer to talking to you into it. LOL. What do I have to do to seal the deal? LOL. Okay. Um, so it sounds like there might have been some reluctance, whether over text messages or phone calls, for her to come up to see you. Is that correct? I never felt that way. I think okay. we've read the other texts. I don't think we'd find that. But you, sir, you, you imply in this text message as well. You had to, you had to do something. You had to do something to seal the deal. What was that about? Yeah, I was. I was yeah, uh, just saying what I was saying. You know. I'm sorry. I didn't understand. What's your question, sir? Well, I said what was what was the point of uh, that message? What was the what? Why did you need to talk her into it? Yeah, I wanted her to come. Okay. But when I asked you a second ago you, if she was reluctant, you said you didn't sense that, so I didn't know. I never sensed that, and I think if we read all the texts, it might make more sense. Okay. Let me 
again on look if you could read the date and time you sent this text. Uh, the 3rd, 7.23 a.m. Okay. And could you read what you wrote there? You promise not to play hard to get when you get here, LOL. Okay. And, and just in case um, people may not understand, uh, what does LOL stand for? Laugh out loud. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we talked a little bit about um, earlier. You made the comment um, that you had engaged in sexual conversations with Miss Arias after she was there. Okay. After she was there. Mm -hmm. So before that, none. And then after she was there, are we talking about that same sort of thing, or are we talking about something different? After she had visited. Mm -hmm. What's the same sort of thing? What are you referring to? Well, the, the, these flirtatious messages, talking about not playing hard to get, that sort of thing. Is that what you mean by? Bef yeah, before she had come, I mean, we talked about what we would do, watching a movie and, and cuddling up, and that's what I was referring to in those texts. OK. And after, was the conversation flirtatious, as I just said? Mm -hmm. OK. That's what you meant by sexual conversations? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Sorry. Uh, uh, and that's what you meant by sexual conversations with her afterwards, right? These texts were showing her a month before she came to visit. Now you're talking about after she was there, so I, I don't know what you're asking. Okay. You told, told us that you had conversations with her of a sexual nature after her visit, correct? Yeah. Okay. What I'm asking you is if those the sexual nature of those conversations was as the same character as what we just saw. We knew each other a lot more by that point. She had spent a whole day with me, so it was a little different. Okay. And how would you characterize these messages, that, these conversations then? Um, started talking, I guess, about you know, why things didn't go further. Um, at one point, I kind of explained why. And she, uh, she complimented me at some point. She also said she's a big girl um, and she can take care of herself that I didn't need to protect her feelings. Okay. And is that what you meant by phone sex earlier or sexual conversations? It, it wasn't necessarily phone sex, but okay. more like what could happen if we met up again. And she did invite me out to California to spend some time with her at a team event after at, you know, a few weeks after we found out Travis had died. Okay. I appreciate you clearing that up for me. Um, as it relates to the visit itself, then, it sounds to me like based on these messages and some of the things you said, I mean, not just these text messages, but the phone conversation, the, uh, the IMs, the text messages, that you were at least hoping for, I'll use the words romantic interaction when she arrived. Is that fair to say? When she came first time? First, when she came to your house, yeah. home in June of 2008, when she arrived on the 5th, you were expecting, maybe expecting is too big a word, you were hoping for a romantic interaction, right? We, we had talked about, you know, joking around on the phone whether I had to make a move if we were snuggling up, and she said, no, she's a snuggler, and, and that's why I laughed, and that was part of the continuing conversation about how she said, you know, would she have to play hard to get? She said she's a snuggler, and that's, that's what that was all in context okay. with. Uh, watching a movie, snuggling up, that okay. was what that was talking about. But then it sounds to me like, given what you said before, you found her attractive, correct? Yes. Okay. And you were interested in pursuing a romantic relationship with her, correct? Yeah. Okay. So it would be reasonable to assume that you were hoping for some sort of 
romantic interaction with her, be it kissing, and I'm not just talking sex, sexual intercourse, I'm talking kissing, cuddling, what have you, that was what you were hoping or, or maybe expecting to happen when she got there in June, is that correct? Now you're talking about before. You know, my, my mind frame was in a different frame before she got there the first time and then this okay, well, after that. You say the first time, but I'm specifically talking about June 5th, Okay, when she came. 2008. Okay. Mm -hmm. the, and that would have been the first time you saw her since April, based on your other testimony. That mm -hmm. would have been the first time you saw her since April of, in Oklahoma City, right? Yes. Okay. And you keep saying first time. Was there another time? That's, that's what I mean. I, no, that, that was the only time that we had spent time together. Okay. Was June 5th to 6th, I guess, near Salt Lake City, at your home in the various Cheesecake Factory and the various restaurants you went to, right? Yeah. Okay. So what I'm, what I'm asking you then, because you kind of qualified it a little bit talking about the different trips, and so it got a little confused, but when she was coming to see you, you're expecting her arrival on June 4th, 5th, and she arrives on June 5th, excuse me, um, you were hoping or expecting a romantic interaction, isn't that correct? Snuggling up, getting to know her. I mean, I didn't know how much I liked her or not, and I figured meeting her personally, I would be able to decide whether I wanted to pursue anything further. So what I've explained is what okay. I was hoping for, um, getting well, to know her more, spend time did, with her. Did the visit meet your expectations? Were you yeah. happy with her when she left? Yes. Okay. Um, and so you testified as well that it sounds like you interacted with her for not quite 24 hours, is that correct? About a day or a little less than a day when um, she left? Wednesday the 4th when she was, yeah. It well, was. it sounds like she arrived, based on your earlier testimony, she arrived at thir Thursday. Yeah, and I wasn't left. able to get older on Wednesday, if right. that's what you mean, yes. Yeah, but I mean, what I'm saying is you, you saw her Thursday yes. around 11, mm -hmm. 10 or 11 by your testimony, mm -hmm. and she left the next day around what time? Maybe midnight one. I, I'm not positive on okay, the time she so left, but it was more, very late. A little mm -hmm. more than a day. Yeah. Okay. Um, but during that time, uh, you saw nothing abnormal? No. That she was acting very similar to the way she had in the past or in all her interactions with you? Yes. Is that right? Yes. And that was, other than the cuts on her hand, that was something consistent um, throughout your interaction with her. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. And it was also true, I believe, what we were talking about this morning, that you also observed her being shy in public, yet a little more talkative and interactive in private. Is that correct? Yes. So that behavior was completely consistent as well. Is that right? That was the first time I saw in public, so I wouldn't have had any reference point there. But yeah. Okay. I thought you used Oklahoma City as a reference point. Three, Three or four minutes. Point. And I spent a lot more time, obviously, that night she came to visit with in public. But that was consistent, the phone interaction and everything else? Yeah. All, all consistent, all appeared perfectly normal to you, is that correct? It seemed normal, yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Redirect. Sir, in terms of, in terms of how much time she spent with you, um, you told us that she arrived what day of the week? On Thursday the 5th. And you did what you guys did, and she stayed part of the night is what you said before, right? Yes. And she left that night, right? Yeah. So she didn't stay more than 24 hours, did she? No. How long did she stay? Uh, I've been 14, 15 hours. Let's talk about these text messages. <coughs> and I'll start with exhibit number 280. Take a look at the upper, what is, well, right there. What does that say up there? Um, that must be text eight of 43. Where are the other texts? Are you hiding them somewhere? No. Are you texting yourself through these things? No, it's a conversation I, between both of us. Where are the texts from her? Yes, you're not gonna it. Sustained. With regard to these, are you responding to her? Yes. And she's sending you things, right? She's going back and forth. Mm -hmm. And by looking at these, can you tell what she texts you in advance of number eight, which is exhibit 280? Not exactly what she said before, no. 
Could she have been telling you, hey, we're going to have some good sex. We don't even know, can't do we? She never said that, but just, yeah, no, I don't know. Any idea as you sit here? I can't remember, it's too long ago. Overruled, you may answer yes or no. Um, What's your question? Any idea what this is responding to? Can't remember, no. 281. What's that? What, up here at the right. 9 943. Good. What are you saying good to? Something she said. Do you know what it is? No. Exhibit uh, 279. You're saying thank you, gorgeous. What are you thanking her for? The conversation, chatting with her. I don't know. Do you know, know by sure. looking at this what you are thanking her yeah, for? She just answered. Overruled, you may answer. Uh, the conversation we had, and I don't know exactly what, what I'm referring to. What was she saying in that conversation as you look at this? I'd need to read it to remember. Argumentative narrative. One at a time, please. Your objection, Mr. Nermy? It's argumentative as the narrative is leading the witness. Overruled, you may answer. What was she saying? Do you even know what she was saying? No. Was... Exhibit 278. Never, exclamation point. What do you never? I have no idea. <laughs> and if we take a look at these with uh, 278, what's the date on that one? Uh, it's May 30th. The what? time just doesn't seem consistent no, no. with our conversation. Take a look at it again. What's the, what's the date? Um, April 30th. And what's the number at the upper right hand corner? 23 of 43 text messages. And then if we take a look in the time, take a look at the time. 8.03. In the morning? Yeah. Then if we take a look at exhibit 279, look at the date. Yeah. Is it the same date as the previous one? 278? Yes, same date. What's the time? 8.13. That's later, right? Right. Sir, one of the things that uh, you were asked about was this cuddling. Do you remember being asked about cuddling uh, on uh, cross-examination? Yeah. yeah. Um, previously, you talked about the interaction that you had with her when she showed up, right? Yeah. Was this the first time when she showed up there, was this the first, this whole time, was this the first episode of sexual interaction that you'd ever had with her? Yeah. You didn't, did you have any sexual interaction in Oklahoma City? No. And the kissing, about what time of the day was it? Um, probably 3 or 4 p.m. And she arrived at what time? 10 or 11, um, 10 or 11. So within five hours of arriving, and you'd never seen her before, this interaction is taking place. Yes. And you said, well, we talked about cuddling. Do you remember that? Yeah. Does cuddling include her moving you around and getting on top of you and grinding on your pelvis? No. Is that what you mean? We never talked about that. Is, but is that what cuddling means? No. Yes, you have to answer. That's not what he said. Overall, to me, answer is. No. What is cuddling? I mean, just snuggling up to a movie. I don't know how it's to. <laughs> uh, one of the things that you were asked about was the future of this relationship. That's one of the things you were asked about mm -hmm. in terms of what was the interaction between you and her um, over this either phone or maybe text messages after she came to see you and you said it changed. Mm -hmm. Remember saying that? Yeah. How did it change? I mean, I uh, had a good time with her, spent the whole day with her, and felt like I knew her a little bit better. In terms of the sex, then, I'm going to be more direct. Do you think that if you had seen her again, second time, in your opinion, given what had happened before, you were there, 
that you would have engaged in sexual intercourse with. Objection calls for speculation. Overruled. Uh, hard to say. I think it could have gone further. I don't know. How about the first time that you were together? Could it have also gone further? Yes. Again, yeah, calls for speculation. Overruled. Could it? I mean, it could have. I don't know under what. One of the things that you also told the defense counsel is that when she talked to you about the Mormon faith was that you had a conversation with her and uh, you were asked, well, with regard to the Mormon faith, based on what you knew of her, did you, did you have any reason to doubt her sincerity? Do you remember being asked about that? Yes, I remember. Applying that same standard, did you have any doubt or in her sincerity involving what she told you as to why she was late in arriving to West Jordan, Utah? Objection, Your Honor. It's beyond the scope of cross and argumentative. Counsel approach. With regard to this issue of sincerity, you were asked about whether or not she was sincere in her trying to re have you return to the church, right? Yeah. And what did she do to try to get you in this sincerity to get you to return to the church? I mean, it wasn't, it was more like casual conversation talking about how she felt um, going to church, praying about it, reading scriptures, you know, just her demeanor on the telephone when you spoke to her before she came out to visit you, her demeanor in these text messages, that uh, one of them being 281, and then after she left you, did that change at all? No. I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Mr. Nermy. Thank you. Mr. Burns, I think you might have already answered this question, but I was afraid it might have got lost in... Uh, the other voice is speaking. Um, Mr. Mar about the speaking voice. If he has something to say to me, he can say it directly. Take your next question. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Martinez asked you if she could have sent you a to You could have been responding to a question saying, we're going to have some really good sex uh, when I get up there, right? He, that was some, he said something to that effect. He asked you that, if that was what you were responding to. Mm -hmm. Do you recall yeah. that? Yeah, I remember. Okay, and I believe you said she didn't send you a text message like that. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, and she didn't, right? No. Okay, thank you, sir. Anything else from the state? No, I don't have anything. All right, it looks like we have some questions. Does any member of the jury have a question for this witness? Looks like there are some in the basket. I don't see any other hands. Counsel, please approach. All right, Mr. Burns, the jurors have some questions for you. Where did the information about Travis Alexander being a flirt come from? Um, it's hard hard to remember because most of the people I talked to knew Travis more than more than Jody. Um, one um, friend of Jody's was uh, Leslie, and I think they might have had a conversation at some point. Um, kind of just, he wanted to move on, she wanted to move on, and... I'm going to check the scope, is that what he was Sorry. asked? Yes, the question was, where did the information about Travis Alexander being a flirt come from? It, I can't be sure, but I would say it would probably be less. Sure. I can't remember. All right, I guess thank that's you. the best answer I can say. Next about. question. With regard to the exhibits you were shown earlier, do mm -hmm. you know where the date and time stamps on the text messages came from? Are they send dates? Do not. Um, yes or no? Don't know. I'm Why guessing. would you say good night at 8.13 a.m.? I thought the same thing when I was reading the text. It didn't fit. It, it, I don't see why I'd say good night at 8 a.m. I don't know why that would happen. I hand you exhibit 286. Testified about that earlier. Do you know what on what date those conversations occurred? Um, 
this was either a um, instant message conversation we had when before she came over to my house or um, uh, maybe the 8th or the 9th before anybody knew Travis had been killed. This was the conversation. I think that's when this one is. Um, it's a few days after she had visited me. Follow up from the state. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Jeremy. I do, Your Honor, briefly. Mr. Burns, you were asked about uh, the dates and probably more specifically the times of the text messages and the juror's question, correct? Yeah. And what you said to us was that you didn't know why the dates were, excuse me, the times were what they were, correct? Okay. And could you answer verbally for us, please? Uh, just what anybody else would guess. It's just from the phone, I guess. Right. I so I'm not asking you to guess. I, okay, just wanted, I just wanted a verbal answer for the court reporter um, that you don't you don't have any explanation for the, the times the times that have seemed inconsistent. I have no explanation with for it. The verbiage, right? No explanation. Okay. Right. But you're not doubting any of the verbiage. You remember you sent those text messages. Those are yours. Yeah. Sounds like yeah. Yes. Yes. Those were yours. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any other questions from the jury? Sir, you may step down. The state may call its next witness. The state call recalls Heather Carter. You may. And gentlemen, we're going to take a 10 minute recess at this time. Please be back in the designated area at 2.35 p.m. and we will start promptly at that time. Please remember the admonition. You are excused. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of Jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Please come forward to be sworn. Can you spell your first and last name? Maureen, M A U R E E N Smith, S M I T H. Raise your right hand. You do solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Thank you. Your name? Maureen Smith. And who do you work for? I work for the Mesa Police Department's Forensic Services Lab. And what do you do there? I'm currently a forensic latent print examiner, too, so my main job duties are to compare latent prints collected from crime scenes to known ink prints, uh, to compare ink print to ink prints, and to um, process evidence. As part of your duties, do you also have people come in, or do you go to people and then take their known fingerprints and affix them, affix them to a sheet of paper for later usage? Yes, we do. Uh, take a look at Exhibit 294. Is this part of your work? Yes. And when did you complete that work that's on that paper? Uh, these prints were taken on June 17, 2008. And the individual whose prints appear there and that you took, are, is that individual in the court today? Yes, she is. Tell me where she is seated and what she is wearing. Um, she is seated at the table at the far end. Um, I'm sorry, I can't see what she's wearing, but she has glasses on. Your Honor, may the record reflect the identification of the defendant? Yes. And those are what? Are they her fingerprints? Or are they more than that or what? These are what we call live scan 10 prints. Um, instead of using ink, uh, I used a computer system. Uh, in which I take the, the top part of the finger and I roll it over a clean piece of glass. The computer takes a digital image of that fingerprint and transports it directly into the database system. And that's what you have there? That's correct. I move for the admission of Exhibit 294. None. Exhibit 294 is admitted. These fingerprints here in Exhibit 294 where were they taken? Were they taken here in Mesa or somewhere else? They were taken at Mesa in our main station uh, where we were located at 130 North Robeson. And they do include a name, correct? Yes, they do. And the backside includes the residence of this individual, correct? That's correct. And what's the address? It's 3, 352 Pine Street, Wairika, California, 96097. I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Cross-examination. Briefly, Your Honor. Uh, 
As it relates to this fingerprints, what were the circumstances of you obtaining them? Uh, I was informed uh, actually by uh, Leighton Print Examiner Connor that um, Detective Flores would be bringing in a couple of individuals uh, to be fingerprinted and that he requested to have uh, their fingerprints not only put into our live scan system but also to have ink prints taken. So we were doing them um, as, as part of the case investigation. Okay, I should be more specific. Did Ms. Arias come in and provide you the opportunity to print her? Yes, she did. Okay, thank you. Any redirect? No, thank you. Any questions from the jury? Thank you. You may step down. The state of Kevin Biggs. Can you spell your last name? Biggs, B I G G S. Mr. Reitman, you do solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. Thank you. Your name, sir? Kevin Biggs. And who do you work for? Mesa Police Department. What do you do for them? I'm a forensic latent print examiner, too. Are you the same, do you do the same sort of work as Maureen Smith? Yes. Did you have occasion to fingerprint somebody by, uh, by the name of Jody Arias? Yes. Is she in the courtroom today? Yes. Tell me where she is seated and what she is wearing. She is seated to the table to my left and has a black long sleeve shirt or jacket on. Your arm is record reflect the identification of the defendant? Yes. Uh, take a look at Exhibit 293. What is this? These are the major case prints that I took of Ms. Arias. And what date did you take them? on 617. My question to you is this. Uh, take a look at Exhibit 294. That's this one here, and yours is 293. What is the difference between 294 and 293? This is the set of prints that was taken. Well, this being, we don't know which, but it would that be Exhibit 294? Exhibit 294? Yes. Yeah, are the prints that were taken on the digital computer were, were digitally collected by Maureen Smith. All right. So they were taken on a computer, right? Correct. What's the difference between that one and the one that you took? Uh, number 294 is also a 10 print card. My prints were taken uh, with ink and paper the old fashioned way, and okay. they are major case prints. So they include palm prints and joint prints also. So yours are a little bit more inclusive. Would that be one difference? Yes. And yours were taken the old-fashioned way with ink and paper? Yes. Um, why were you taking yours that way if you already had the other ones? Why was that being done? What's the difference? The, the, the uh, computer or the, or the eighth assistant that we had only did the 10 prints. There was an option in our building to have palm prints also, but they're pretty limiting on what they can take. With the way I did it, I was able to get all of the rigid detail, including the two joints of the hand and both edges of the hand, which the palm print on the APHA system does not collect. So you, ha you had more information that was not collected as part of the APHA system, is that right? Is that what you're saying? Correct. At the time that I took these, and the machine that we were using did not have the option to collect palm prints. We only had the option to do the 10 prints. With regard to a fingerprint, can it be dated? For example, if it's lifted from a place, can it be dated? In other words, if you pick, you get it, you identify it, can you then say it was left on this date at such and such a time? No, we would have to go back to a time that it was cleaned or the item was manufactured, but no, there's no way to date it other than that. All right. I move for the admission of exhibit two and three. Any objection? Well, wait, Your Honor. No objection. 293 is admitted. And let's take a look at this. And this is the difference that you're talking about. This is actually done with ink and paper. Correct. correct. And in terms of the information that's provided here, the height and the weight, uh, who provides that? Miss Arias gave that to me. And the date of birth, did she also provide that? Yes. Is it signed by her? Yes. You were talking about how yours has an addition to it. Take a look at the back of one of them. What are we looking at here? That is the left palm print. 
And then we have something, what is this right here? That's a left little finger on the front of it. When I, after rolling the left little finger on the front, there's not any more space up there. I felt I needed to roll it again. And so I rolled it back here on the back and then labeled it. And what is this over here on the top? Looks like just like a smudge. That's going to be the thinner side of the palm. The, the I'm sorry, the, the thumb side over here, the extreme edge that I was talking about, the wing collect that we don't get on the APHIS system. Is this the left? It, Given that this says left, this is the left palm, correct? Yes. And the one in the back would be the right palm then, right? Correct. I don't have any other questions, thank you. Cross-examination. Sir, where were these prints obtained? At the Mesa Police Main Station at 130 North Robeson in the latent print unit. Okay. And Ms. Arias came in, voluntarily gave you your prints, uh, all the prints you wanted and left. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Any redirect? No, thank you. Any questions from the jury? Thank you. You may step down. Thank you. Just let me check and see who got that. Thank you. Yes. yes. Ms. Smith, please take the stand. You are still under oath. Do you understand? Mr. Martinez. Your name, please. Maureen Smith. With regard to this case, you told us that you were a latent print examiner, is that what you're saying? That's correct. Um, do you also do the collection of any biological substances for later testing? Yes, we do. And, and what is it that you do? Um, if we're requested, we are able to collect um, either uh, DNA samples that are unknowns or we are able to collect DNA samples for known purposes. With regard to the individual Jordi areas that you previously identified, did you take any biological samples from her? Yes, I did. What did you take? Uh, I collected what is called a buckle swab, which is a swabbing of the inner lining of the, of the cheek. Uh, we just gently take a sterile swab and uh, swab the inside of the cheek cells and um, collect those into a uh, secure packaging. I don't have any other questions. Cross-examination. Briefly, Your Honor. Ms. Smith, you just testified earlier that uh, Ms. Arias came into the station, gave you her prints, and departed. I take it the buckle swab was obtained the same day in the same manner, is that correct? Yes, it was. Okay, thank you. Any redirect? No, thank you. Any questions from the jury? Thank you. You may step down again. Heather Carter. Ms. Connor, you are still under arrest. Do you understand? Yes, I do. You may proceed. Your name, please. It's Heather Connor. Uh, Ma'am, last time we were uh, here, we were talking about uh, exhibit number 139. Do you remember talking about this? Yes, I do. And specifically with regard to this, what are we looking at? This is the west wall of the hallway, hallway between the master bedroom and bathroom. And it's showing a piece of wall that has a square drawn around it. And you actually seized that square, right? Yes, I did. And that would be exhibit number 239, correct? Yes. And exhibit number 140, we did not look at that, which is a photograph. What is it that we're looking at here? What you see in this photograph is a latent palm impression that has been developed on the wall. So that's friction ridge skin from the palm, palmer side of your hand. How, was this developed at the site or was it developed somewhere else? This was developed while we were at, while I was at the scene. And that's why you decided to take the wall? That's correct. So once you take it back to the lab, what did you do with it? Additional photographs were taken of this this latent impression in, in the laboratory after the wall was seized. Why were there additional photographs taken of this particular fingerprint? While we were at the scene, photographs were taken of the wall and the print on the wall. However, it being that it was in the hallway, it was somewhat of a tight space with which to work with a camera and a tripod. So the intent was in case the photographs at the scene didn't turn out as well as they might be able to, we could take addition, I could take additional photographs in the laboratory. In terms of the comparison that may be done later, 
is the comparison then done between the wall or is it done between the photograph of the wall and the known fingerprints? The comparison is done between the photograph of the latent print and the knowns. Take a look at uh, Exhibit 292. What is this? This is the photograph of the latent palm print from the wall. And is it a photograph of this that we're looking at, which is exhibit number 140, or is it 140? In other words, is that just a black and white photograph of this, or is that a different photograph? There were numerous photographs taken of the same ridge detail. I don't know if it's the exact same photo, but it is of the same exact ridge detail and surface. We, in looking at uh, exhibit 140, there is an arrow that, there, what does that mean? That is indicating the directionality of the, the print. I'm trying to orient it on the wall. So the up means that the wall went up from there. To the ceiling? Yes. LCV stands for? Leuco Crystal Violet. And impression AD, what is that? AD was the designator, the unique identifier given to this latent impression within the scene. We move to the admission of Exhibit 292. No objection. Exhibit 292 is admitted. Let's start at the, what I'm calling the lower right hand corner. And that would be right here. What is that? What are those notations? There you have my initials, HC, my employee ID number, which is 16166, and the date 626 of 08. And why, why is that date on there? That is the date that this latent print was individualized. And at the top, what is, what is that? 169A, what is that about? That is the designator that was assigned by me to the latent print. The latent print is now latent impression 169A. Even though down here we have impression AD, it's the same one. It is. And the second page is, so this is exhibit, is that just the back of it? Yes, yes. that's the information that was on the, that's on the back of the photograph. Did you have occasion to compare 292 to, uh, first of all, exhibit 294, which is, looks just like a 10 print card. Did you do that or not? No, this was not compared to this record. Okay. How about exhibit 293? Did you work with this? Yes. What did you do with regard to that? The latent palm print was compared to the known impressions on this exemplar, and this was the exemplar used in the individualization. And with regard to Exhibit 292, what are your, what were your findings or what were your conclusions? Latent print 169A was individualized as the left palm of Jody Ann Arias. Is that the notation that's here on the left? That's correct. Who put that on there? I did. And as we look at the wall here, which is exhibit number 229, which is the top, this one or this, or the, this one right here with the little insignia? May I see it, please? Sure. The wall was oriented this way. And where would the fingerprint have been? This region. And in that particular region, which which finger which uh, palm print was it? Which the left or the right? It's the left palm. And can you tell us how it was on there using your left palm print? Absolutely. If I may stand. Sure. It's this region of the left palm. Okay. In this direction. So if we remember our, go ahead and keep your, your arm that way. If we remember our directions, 
your fingers would then be in a northerly direction if we look at the diagram, the, the diagram, right? That would be correct. And then the basket would be behind you, right? Yes. Thank you. We also have occasion to impound exhibit number 217. Yes, I did. And what is exhibit 217? This is a scale that was collected as item number 15LB. And was this in the bathroom? Yes, it was. Is this the one that has the glass, or is this the one that's black? This has a glass-like top. Right. Move for the admission of Exhibit 217. No objection. 217 is admitted. Was there a bathtub in the bathroom? Yes, there was. And Exhibit 227, is that? The Yes, it is. Move for the admission of exhibit two twenty seven. Yes. No objection. Exhibit 227 is admitted. And I'm looking at the photographs, you notice that there was, uh, on the bed, do you remember that there were some items on it? And I guess, I'll, I can't show you a picture of it. Exhibit 63 and 64. You see this uh, here? Yes, I do. And exhibit number 64. This right here. Did you collect that? I don't think so. Take a look at uh, exhibit number 12. I don't recall every item in there, but we went over them on Thursday of last week. There's a sh there's sheets, another type of sheet item that has buttons on it. I, from personal experience, I think I would say it's a duvet cover, something along those lines, towels and the like. Exhibit 130. This area here. Where is this area, first of all? That is the carpet leading from the master bedroom right at the entryway to the hallway that leads to the master bath. And Exhibit 131 shows us what? Showing, that is showing a bird's eye view of some of the red stains that's on the carpet. 
and this right here? That's the tile in the hallway. What's exhibit 2-11? It's wrapped in butcher paper, but it appears to be the piece of carpet that was cut out and collected this piece of carpet. When you say that, it, and you say that it appears, This is the piece of carpet. I can see some of the staining on the interior fold. Okay. I remember the admission of Exhibit 211. That's a number on it right here. 211. Mr. Mayor, maybe you want to look at it. Why don't you walk up and do so? Thank you. No, Thank you. 211 is admitted. If you could hold it up, I think, so that we could all look at it that way. And ma'am, if you take a look at the screen over there, which is 131, can you see it behind you or there on the side? Yes. You see this area here, yes. the tail? And you see that the tile is this way? What's in this direction? Is the bathroom in this direction? That's correct. Can you orient it with that on top? So this is what we're, this is how it was at the house with this being the northerly direction. Yes. Uh, nor northerly direction? I'm sorry, southerly direction. That's correct. If you could uh, place it in this container. Oh, putting it back? Yes. Okay. Cross examination. with you there? Yes, I do. Okay. I believe last week, uh, one of the things you did is you testified about the contents of the washing machine. Do you recall that? Yes. Okay. And we saw well, several things in there, but one of the things we saw was a camera, correct? Yes. Okay. And the other thing we saw was various articles, the towels and clothing, that sort of thing. That's correct. Okay. Um, Let me draw your attention back to what has previously been marked and entered as Exhibit uh, 216. I may have your honor. Ma'am, if you could be so kind again, if, if I recall correctly, last week you testified uh, that you believe the uh, towel in that laundry had been bleached. Is that correct? If I recall, I was asked if I was familiar with what bleach would do to an item of clothing and whether this resembled what I, I was familiar with, some, something along those lines. Okay, and you, I think you gave us the opinion that you believe that that towel uh, had incurred bleach. Is that correct? Or had encountered bleach, perhaps? Had been bleached. I don't know if it has been bleached. There's certainly, from personal experience, knowing what bleach does to clothes, it resembles what bleach would do to an item of clothing. If you could do me a favor, if you could look through, take them out if, if need be, um, look through them and see if you see any other item that has any evidence of being bleached or having uh, contact with bleach. Did you do that for us? Certainly. Ms. Connor, if you recall last week, that was the item you believe had been bleached. 
has the same appearance as what bleach may appear, yes. Okay. And forgive me, I, I know you probably don't uh, recall your exact words and I don't either, so I, but <laughs> that's a yes. Okay. And if you could look through any of the other items. And you're holding a sock. Is there any appearance of bleach on that sock? There are orange, there's orange coloration to an otherwise very dark sock. Okay. And you're holding up another sock. Yes. Is there any evidence of bleach on that item? Uh, certainly an orange coloration that's different than the remainder of the sock. Okay. There's different coloration on this shirt, but I don't know the cause of that. And I believe you testified last week that that was a tie-dyed shirt, that that appeared to be a tie-dyed shirt, correct? I don't recall that. Okay. Would you agree with that assessment today? It certainly could be. Okay. And ma'am, I see you're going through many items. Are you not seeing... Could you just hold them up? You seem to be shuffling through them. Could you just take a good look and make sure that... No, is, is there any in indication of bleach on that sock? Not that I see. Okay. And do you have another sock? Is there any indication of bleach on that? No, sir. Okay. And the undergarments? I, I can't speak to whether be it's been bleached. Yes. It would be difficult to tell, in Fair my opinion. Enough. Don't appear to be anything on okay. that sock. And the shorts, is there any appearance of bleach on those? Not that I see. Okay. and the t-shirt you're holding. Not that I see. Okay. Would you like me to continue? Well, is that all the items, ma'am, or was there? There, there are a few additional items okay. in here. Yeah, please. Okay. I don't see anything on this. On this sock, correct? I don't see anything obvious on okay. this pair of pants. And is that all the entire contents there? An another white item to which we could not determine. That would be correct. Fair enough. Without going through every single sock, I that I believe is everything that's in here. Okay. I would have to pull them out one by one otherwise. I understand. But no indication of bleach on those, all those items, correct? Not during this cursory look, no. Okay. Um, thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I find approach again, Your Honor? Yes. Now I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 213 and entered, excuse me, as Exhibit 213. Exhibit 216. All those items were in the same load of wash. Is that correct? Was that item 216? Yes, the one you just looked at. Those were all what was taken out of that same load of wash when you were there at the, at the crime scene, correct? Yes, it okay. was. And just to further clarify, too, you mentioned, I believe, that um, there was a biological unit that collected 
items of biological evidence, correct? Um, members of the biology unit of the forensic services section responded to the scene and helped me process it. They identified certain stains in other areas of the house and performed preliminary testing. I did all the collection of the biological evidence. Okay. But it, my understanding was that the biological unit or the people that do the biological testing did not test that. Is that correct? Is that what you, I believe that's what you told us last week, but I just want to make sure that's correct. I don't have any work in the biology unit. I wouldn't be able to tell you what items were tested and not. Okay. But to your knowledge, that wasn't immediately tested at the scene or, or when you collected it? The type of testing that was performed at the scene was preliminary testing on certain stains that we found in, very, in, in some areas of the home. Mm -hmm. The items within the washing machine were not tested at the scene. Okay. And then if you could um, be so kind as to open up what's been marked uh, Exhibit 213. just that is the camera bag correct this is a camera bag that was collected from the loft area of the residence yes okay. um, inside that bag was there um, a strap associated with the camera there is a strap inside I don't know to what, what camera it would be associated but okay. there is a strap okay and it looks like although some of the letters may be cut off it looks like there's a brand on that strap. Is that? It shows Sony. Okay. And is that the only strap in there? Inside the bag, yes, there's yeah. a, a strap on the bag itself. Right. Okay. Moment, Your Honor. Yeah. Nothing further. Thank you. Did he redirect? Ma'am, with regard to Exhibit 216 and what I'm going to call the tie-dye T-shirt, do you know what size it was? I would, please. What size? This is marked an M for medium. How about the other white T-shirt? That is March L, large. Ma'am, you also were asking, or you were asked about who collected the biological evidence at the scene. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. With regard to, and I'm looking at the photograph, Exhibit 140, the fingerprint. Objection, Your Honor, this is Jim. So I asked her about the collection at, in the washing machine. I think he was asking her about the collection at the scene and how it was done. That's what he asked her. Council approach. Ma'am, with regard to the collection of any biological substances at the scene, did you do that? Yes, I did. With regard to this photograph involving the palm print number 140, did you collect uh, or check this area for biological substances? This particular area, the, the piece of wall containing the print was cut out and there was testing performed after, after the fact, but not at the scene. Okay, so it wasn't done at the scene, it was done somewhere else. That's correct. And you didn't do that though, right? I did not. Okay. I don't have any other questions. Mr. Nermi? I have no, no questions. Any questions? It looks like we do have a question from the juror. Any other questions from the jury for this witness? Counsel, please approach. Ms. Connor, the jurors have some questions for you. Why was the towel not tested for bleaching? I don't know of any testing that we could perform at the crime lab that would test for bleach, but I don't work in the other units. I, I don't know the answer to that question. 
Was there a wrist or a neck strap on the camera in the washing machine? Would it be possible to see the photograph of the item that we've seen prior? Mr. Martinez. Exhibit 14, Exhibit 15, and Exhibit 16. It does not appear that there is a strap on that camera. Is every inch of all surfaces tested for prints? No, it is not. How are decisions made to test or not test a given area? For example, were the walls dusted from floor to ceiling? The walls were not dusted from floor to ceiling. A determination is made based on training and experience of the latent examiners and crime scene investigators that are at the scene uh, regarding what areas will be processed for latent prints. In this case, along the hallway walls, for example, there was a wide swath of the wall that was tested. I would estimate from knee height to approximately neck chest level. The areas that would most likely be touched in, on a, with regular handling or movement around the house. It, it's not feasible for us to be able to process every inch of the house from floor to ceiling. So we examine the scene and determine what areas are gonna be the most probative and likely to yield latent prints. What type of key is needed to unlock the master bedroom door? I don't know that. Was the knife that was used in this crime recovered at the scene? I don't know that either. There were knives that were collected from the scene. I cannot speak to whether or not they were involved. Follow up from the state. Okay, thank you. Looks like we have an additional question. Council, please approach. Ms. Connor, how long will a print last on a surface if it is not washed or disturbed? The answer is possibly indefinitely. There is no way to date a latent impression. You can consider things such as the date of manufacture of, of an item, such as a soda can. Obviously, the print could not have been left before the soda can was made or created. In the same regard, if you have a window, for example, and it's been washed, you can assume in some cases that any prints that are on that would be since the last washing if the washing was very thorough. Depending on the type of residue that leaves that print, it can last for a very long time. Any follow-up from the state? Yes. With regard to when a fingerprint is left behind, uh, if somebody says, for example, hypothetically, I was there on June 4th, whatever year, and I killed this individual, and I hadn't been there before that, since before May, and I haven't been there since then, would you be able to date that fingerprint? I am not able to date any fingerprints. Would you be able to tell us what was left, given the other information? You used the example of a soda can. Would yes. you be able to date it, in the, or not date it, or tell us what it was left in that hypothetical? Will you repeat the hypothetical, please? Sure. Hypothetical is, I have a killing, and you have an individual who says, I did the killing on June 4th, and they haven't been there for months, and they haven't been there in months after that. With regard to a fingerprint, let's say that's collected from a wall, would you then be able to say, well, I believe based on the fact that I found the fingerprint and other information, my opinion is the fingerprint was left on such and such a date in that hypothetical of June 4th. It depends on other circumstances within the case. If I have 
information regarding what potential type of residue or substance a print is left, and there's enough information, I may be able to guess. The, assume that you have the information that's left behind with regard to Exhibit 140. Assume that's the information you have. Late, the latent impression that was called 169A when it was compared or impression AD was developed with a chemical that we use in search situations where we believe there may have been a print that is left in blood, for example. Because it does not, it does not react with the normal constituents of fingerprint residue, it's possible to draw some conclusion, but I still wouldn't be able to give you an exact dating of a print. What conclusions can you draw? John, this goes beyond the scope of the question. It's overruled. This particular chemical was used to process that area of the wall because we saw a great deal of red stain, because I saw a great deal of red staining in that, that area. My belief that it, it was possible that there could be a print on the wall that could be in a biological substance such as blood. I used this chemical because of that with the belief that if any prints were developed with the chemical, they may have been left at the time of the crime. Anything else? Mr. Nermy? Nothing, Any other questions from the jury? Thank you, you may step down. Mr. Martinez? The state calls Esteban Flores to the stand. Detective, you are still under oath, do you understand? Yes, I do. Your name, please? Esteban Flores. right? Yes. You're the case agent, right? Yes. And previously we discussed a conversation that you had with the defendant telephonically on June 10th of um, 2008, correct? Yes. Did you also have a conversation with her after that? Yes, I did. Did you have a conversation with her on June 25, 2008? Yes, I did. That would have been approximately two weeks later, correct? Correct. How, what was the purpose of this second call? Uh, Follow-up questions. And uh, we had uh, gone through with the investigation and more information had come in at that point. And did you initiate this call or was this also in response to her calling in? Uh, I don't remember exactly, but I remember her calling me a few times and I was trying to get a hold of her as well, uh, along with calling other people at that time. Was this tape recorded? Yes, it was. And during this conversation, did you have more pointed questions about her relationship with Mr. Alexander? Yes, I wanted to clarify their relationship. Sir, with regard to how they met, did you uh, address that issue with her on June 25, 2008, on the telephone? Yes, I did. I'll show you exhibit number 310 for purposes of record keeping. This is uh, clip number eight. Yes. And you've seen it before we came here today, right? Yes, I did. Move for the admission of uh, exhibit number 310. Judge, I'm still reviewing the excerpt, so we'll take a moment. Yes, you may take a moment. Yeah, thank you. No objection, Your Honor. Exhibit 310 is admitted. How long did you guys actually know each other? We met in September of 2006. At the MGM Grand. Yeah, and that was the pre legal uh, international convention okay. where tens of thousands of people go. And when did you guys actually start dating? Um, not for a while. We met in September. Uh, the following weekend, he invited me to church. And the following Wednesday of that Sunday, he gave me a copy of the Book of Mormon. I started reading it. I got baptized November 26th. Um, we would talk a lot and hang out a lot. And, we kind of had like a thing, and there was definitely an attraction and an interest, but we weren't officially dating until about February of 2007, early February, say. Um, and I think it just uh, uh, a string of events sort of pushed that together. Travis has kind of a commitment uh, phobia, I would guess you could say. Sir, did you 
then discuss with her the breakup? Yes. I'm going to show you exhibit 309, clip number nine. And is that the one that discusses that? Yes. This conversation was quite lengthy, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Is it uh, approximately an hour and 45 minutes? Right about that. I move for the addition of exhibit 309. Brandon, is admitted. Down here. Down here. No, I didn't move down actually until June, which was right about the time we broke up, ironically. She went um, in June of 2007, and you guys broke up soon after? Yeah, we broke up right about the same time. Did you also ask her about the reason for the uh, breakup? Yes, I did. <clears throat> Exhibit number 296, which is clip 22. Yes. Is that it? Move for the admission of that exhibit to clip 22. 296 is admitted. I've been in relationships before where the, the other guy wasn't faithful, and there's like a distinctive gut feeling that you just have, and that I've noticed, and because I've been in relationships where they were faithful, at least to my knowledge, they were totally faithful. Um, and that, that feeling just isn't there. And so I had this feeling with Travis, and I gently asked him about it. He got really upset, and he's like, he's like, no, there's nothing there. Don't worry about it. And, and I knew he was on his phone texting a lot, and I knew he was texting these girls. And I was like, um, I was like, well, are you, what about your text messages? He's like, look, I can be flirtatious, but there's nothing going on. And I said, okay. So uh, this was last year, I think in June. <clears throat> and one day he was taking a nap, and I felt. This is why we lost. This is one of the reasons we lost all of our trust. Um, I just I shouldn't have done this, but I grabbed his phone and I looked at his text messages, and I found there were tons of girls that I'd never heard of, and I knew that he knew a lot of people from the business, so I didn't worry too much about it. But what bothered me was there were um, not only were some flirtations like I had suspected, which bothered me, but it wasn't necessarily a crime. Um, but there were plenty of uh, uh, there were like plans, like things like. Um, well, where do you want to meet? Oh, well, I don't know where's the best place for where's the best place wherever the best place for us to make out is, you know. And I was like, what? Oh my gosh, you know, we've been dating for, for a few months at this point, and and he always said, well, we're not dating anybody else, and and to him that was I think reasonable enough because I think in his mind it, he was making out with other girls, but he wasn't dating them was okay. And the only reason I think that's true is because of what we continued to do while he was dating Lisa, and I didn't realize that either. Um, so I confronted him about it. Actually, I didn't confront him at first. I should have been an adult about it and confronted him, but I held it in for a few weeks, and then it all came out, and that's when we broke up. And so I just realized that I, I, don't, I didn't feel like I could trust him fully to be monogamous, and I don't think that he could trust me fully to not get back in his phone someday and then try to find something out. So. Yeah. After she moved here to Mesa, June, as she indicated after the breakup, did you ask her what she did here or what kind of work it was that she did here? I believe she was waitressing, uh, just did you discuss odd, it with her in the Did you discuss it with her on the tape? Yes. Take a look at exhibit 308. This is clip number 10. And did you review it before coming to court? Yes, clip 10. And is this the one that deals with this issue about what she did when she moved to Mesa? Yes. I move for the ex uh, admission of Exhibit 308. No objection. 308 is admitted. Yeah, the whole time you were down here, then you just kind of um, tried to work. And I, yeah, I guess I figured, you know, like Mesa is like the Mormon land of opportunity, honestly. Yeah. I kind of the way I look at it. And with regard to what she did between the time she was here and came out here, in June until April until she moved, did you and she discuss uh, what she did then? Yes. Take a look at uh, Exhibit 306, clip number 12, and is that clip described that portion of the conversation? Yes. Move for the admission of Exhibit 
306, clip number 12. No objection. 306 is admitted. Did you just pass him around town uh, doing your thing till April or so? I think you left. Uh, yeah, I hung around. I was in the University 6 ward, went there. He was in his Desert Ridge ward, and we, uh, we didn't live that far apart, so I, mean, I was over there a lot. Um, not, not a lot, lot, because he had his own social circle from his church that I didn't really want to interact with, <laughs> because I, I sensed that maybe there was a little bit of awkwardness there because of Lisa and because of Elena. And oh, I, that's right. Here's Lisa right after that. During the time that they were broken up between June and April, did you then also talk to her about the type of relationship that they had? Yes. Take a look at uh, exhibits number 305, which is clip 13, and exhibit 312, which is clip number 5. Did you listen to these before you came, and does that describe their relationship? while they were broken up? Yes. I move for the admission of exhibits 305 and 312. No objection. Exhibit 305 and 312 is admitted. And you mentioned it. I mean, obviously, you guys dated before. And yeah, we did. We dated were, last year. We're kind of just still really good friends, but not you know, romantically seeing each other anymore. Uh, not exactly. <laughs> Um, uh, we broke up last, kind of. yeah, and I would say there was, there was certainly a romantic side to it, you could say, or an intimate side to it, um, but, uh, we weren't exactly on the path to marriage, anything like that, and we both knew that. And exhibit number 304, that's clip number 14. Did you review it before you came here, and is that what this is, what, in, what it indicates? Yes, 14. I move for the admission of exhibit number 304. 304 is admitted. Have you actually at his house was in April when you left? Yeah, it was April I spent. Um, I had, my friend Rachel that I originally moved down with gave me a futon to sleep on, uh -huh. and I gave that back. Um, about a week, week and a half prior to moving, her, her and her husband came out with his truck and they loaded it up because they, they did, were just lending it to me and I didn't want to move it. So they came and got it and I didn't have a bed. And, and he was like, you know, you just come stay with me. So I pretty much stayed there <clears throat> for the last week. Left. Yes, Rumi said something about, you You know, the last day you had a U-Haul and you were leaving and uh, you had stopped by to say goodbye or something. Yeah, I had the U-Haul, and I, I was already there, but I parked it around the corner because it was huge, and I had a car, my car on the back of it, so I couldn't just park it right out in front of his house. So there's a, there's a little, uh, if you go just past his house around the corner, I had the U-Haul parked there. Okay. It's like, 
So that was oh, yeah. Do you remember what day April that was? I don't. I want to say I keep thinking the ninth, but before you quote me on that, I can I can check. But towards the beginning of April. It, yeah, it was like more, more towards the middle, but it was already was maybe towards the beginning. Yeah. Because originally I was supposed to leave early April, like April first, like a little after April Fool's, but I ended up staying um, another four or five days. Did you like, stay there with him or something? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, with him. Did you then discuss with her the purchase by Mr. Alexander of the camera? Yes, I did. And. Uh, does Exhibit 302, Clip 16, Exhibit 301, Clip 17, deal with the purchase of the camera and her role in that purchase? Yes. I move for the admission of Exhibit 301 and 302. Uh, yes. 301 and 302 are admitted. Yeah, yeah I have a lot of pictures. Actually, he just bought a, he had just purchased the camera. Uh, yeah, I remember that. Uh, I mean, we found the box in his house and everything. Yeah, he, um... Did, did you help him buy that, or...? I did, yeah. I was I was living here, but he called me for uh, advice, and, yeah, I, and I was on the phone with him. That's who I called. I, I saw know. somebody who knew what they were doing before I bought a camera. Yeah, and I guess since I was a photographer, he, he, he texted me, and he was like, what do you think of this camera? And I texted him back, well, what about this? And finally, I was like, just call me. This is too complicated. So he called me, and he was going over. I was like, ask her this. And so he was asking the sales rep, well, what about this, this, and this? And... Where is the flash located in megapixels and the brand? I was like, don't get into Kodak, you know, <clears throat> just different things. So eventually he settled on, I don't know what he got, but it was, it sounded like it was a really nice camera. And exhibit 301. Do you remember when he so, got that camera? Uh, April, maybe? I know it was after I moved. It could have been in May. Could have been in May. Um, I know it was after I moved up here because I was I was here while I was on the phone with him purchasing it. So you, so never, you never got to see the camera then or anything. No, and I'm trying to remember. Well, we maybe. the reason I'm asking is because we found this camera and, and you know it's pretty much ruined and we didn't know why. Oh. I can't you know discuss why, but you know or how it's ruined, but you know, we just it, we just don't found it. We have no idea why somebody would you know destroy his camera. And, uh, oh. I wonder if you could describe it to me, but obviously you haven't seen it. You've never touched it, never seen it. So. No, um, well, I think, I'm thinking there's a picture of him on Facebook where he took a picture of himself in the mirror. Okay. And I think that's his camera. So, I mean, I can't tell what it is, though, because the picture isn't really sharp and it's a small resolution. But there's a picture of him on his profile picture on Facebook. Oh, where he's he's kind of looking. Oh, yeah. In terms of the June 2nd, 2008 trip, did you then try to talk to her about that and the trip as it began and um, where she was on Tuesday night, who she spoke with, as well as whether or not she talked to Mr. Alexander on that Tuesday night? Did you discuss that with her? Yes, I did. I'm showing you exhibits 313, 316, and 299 which are clips 4, 1, and 19, respectively. Are those the clips where you discuss this issue of the trip and her contact with the victim? Yes. I move for the admission of Exhibit 313, 316, and 299. No objection. Exhibit 313, 316, and 299 are admitted. Let's listen to Exhibit 316 first. Calling Jody Arias. It's uh, 625.08 at 11.05 hours. DR 2008 
is just to kind of figure out what was going on the week um, just prior to when we when we found uh, Travis. Because um, mm -hmm. we're not we're still not sure what day you know this incident happened. We're trying to figure mm -hmm. out you know who had contact with them. And I know I talked to you you know a couple weeks ago about what was going on, but it was kind of brief, and I was just uh -huh. trying to get to everybody who yeah. had a theory or whatever. But um, can, can you tell me what was going on? Let's just say starting on Monday, I think it was the second. Monday the second. Tell me if you or when you had contact with them or the last. Yeah, time. I think I know that I talked to him early Monday morning, uh, which would have I was just up late Sunday night, for example, and uh, I probably talked to him. It may have been a good 45 minutes that that morning, and we were just talking about. Um, how he, was, he had a conversation with another person about Gordon Hinckley, and they were, it was a really good conversation. And, you know, he was just talking a lot about what was said there. And uh, I think we probably talked till about 4 in the morning, I'd say. Wow. It was, yeah, it was, we were, he was a night owl, I'm a night owl. And it wasn't a really long conversation. Like, we've had conversations that have lasted hours and hours, but this one was probably only, I want to say 45 minutes. It may have been longer. I guess I could check. And that was late at night? Well, technically it was early Monday morning. That was in a second. So, um, yeah, that, that was primarily what that one consisted of. And, you know, he knew I was taking a road trip that week. And he was kind of guilting me because I wasn't going to Arizona. I was going to Utah. Um, okay. Why, was yeah, there, nice was there a conference or something in Arizona as well? Or? It was um, the, the primary reason, I, and I didn't tell Travis this, but the primary reason I was going there was to meet somebody. Um, and, you know, we, we weren't, like, totally open about our dating life just because it was just an area where we just kind of decided it would be best to not give each other all those details. And so, you know, just because we had a past from before. And, you know, he we kept each other, like, moderately informed. Like, he told me a little bit about this person and a little bit about this person, but we didn't go into a lot of details. So I didn't tell him that I was making this big trip out to Utah to go see somebody. <clears throat> I think he suspected it, though. He was just like, well, who are, you gonna, who are you going out there to see? And I'm like, oh, nobody. I'm just going out, you know, to see friends. Because we both have um, a mutual circle of friends in Utah, yeah. you know, from prepaid legal. So I told him that that was the reason I was going. Was there is a, there's a briefing out there. It's called a business briefing, which happens every week on Thursday night. So um, I was leaving for that, and, you know. Was actually there was that reason because I knew I would see a lot of my friends that night, but also to spend time with with my other friend that I was meeting, um, and his name is Ryan. Um, so I talked to him that day, and later on that morning I got on the road. Um, and my car isn't the best mechanically, so I stopped in Reading at the airport to rent a car, and someone had driven me there. My my future soon-to-be sister-in-law drove me there. Um, and let's see, I got the car, came back to my brother's house and took a nap for a while because I had been up all night. And then I got on the road and I went to Santa Cruz and I met up with some other friends who went from the Monterey area. Okay. So I have lots of friends there and I stayed the night at a friend's house there and visited with some other friends, um, the next day and then drove to LA so that I could see my, uh, other friend's baby. I'm a photographer. I don't know if I told you that. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I'm a photographer. She just recently had a baby, and I'm trying to build my portfolio with, um, you know, infants and things like that. And she what was really excited. Name Her name is Laura Brewer. She actually never called me back. She did call me back, but she called me back too late. So I couldn't just wait around for her. I had an itinerary. And she was that just was, a friend, or? She, um... She's a really close friend. I dated her brother for about four years, so we were, we're a lot like family still. Oh, okay. Hang on just a quick second. I'm sorry. Are you still there? Yeah. I'm sorry. My phone, i got to figure it out. I need it. Sorry, I'm just getting out of my car. It's a little distracting. No, I'm sorry, I did talk to him on Tuesday night. Oh, Tuesday night. It was brief, though. Um, like, that was a matter of just a few minutes. It wasn't like a really in-depth conversation. 
Yes, we do. Exhibits 314 and 315 are admitted.
refueled and all that, and they talked on the phone for a little bit, and then just got on the road and went to Utah. Um, slept in my car. <laughs> Man, that's a long drive from L.A. It's about, it's about nine hours. So, yeah, it's actually just as long to go from L.A. to West Jordan as it is to go from White Rica to L.A. Um, let's see. So the meeting in Utah, when did that happen? Mm-hmm. That was Thursday night at 7 o'clock. I don't remember the exact location, but I follow Ryan there. Oh, so you met him then? Yeah. Yeah, I ended up, um, we crashed at his house for a little while and, you know, just hung out and all that. And then, uh, okay. went to the, and then slept a little bit longer because I was, you know, okay. before I got on the road. And Somebody had talked to, I can't remember who it was up there in Utah. Um, they called me and just, they said they knew, they knew Travis. They said that there was a, a meeting on Wednesday. Or was it Thursday? Uh, there is a luncheon on Wednesday. <clears throat> I didn't go to that, though. I don't think okay. I went to that. No, I, I went to some kind of meeting. It was at a restaurant. The restaurant owner's name is Chris, and he's in the, he was recruited by Brian. Well, maybe that's what they said. It, it, it's kind of like a split-up meeting. One day they had, like, a luncheon, and then the other day the meeting. That's, that's yeah. what they meant. Yeah, I don't think I went to the luncheon. Um, <clears throat> It's like a thing that happens at Twitch. It's the same kind of deal, only it's set in a restaurant instead of a like a business-style meeting. Yeah. Whereas in the meeting, you just kind of sit for an hour and you listen to a presentation for 45 minutes or however long it takes. Mm-hmm. And uh, to lunch, and you listen to the same thing, but you get to eat lunch. And it's in a restaurant. So did you ever stop by Vegas on the way up? I went to Vegas. <laughs> no. <laughs> I go there once a year anyway for the free state legal thing, and I've never... I've been a gambler <laughs> or that kind of lifestyle, so uh, no, I, I just drove through. I drove through, um, I, I went through Boulder City and I went through Vegas. I don't remember all, I think Henderson, um, you know, until I went up through, I think it was St. George. It took a while. I was on the phone with the night with Ryan that time, but, um, you know, so he could keep me awake, but I still had to pull over anyway. So, I mean, I'm not. I'm, I'm not shy about just pulling over wherever and sleeping in my car. Oh, then the only time on the road. It is. It is. It's, it's not the smartest thing. I realize that. Um, I usually park my car in a place where I can just drive off if I need to, so I have it backed out instead of, um, you know, and I have the keys in the ignition. I've got, I'm ready to go. But e- either way, it's still kind of unsafe. Anyone could break a window or something. But. Oh, Day and age, you need to some protection or something if you're driving along. I was thinking of that. I know, and I, I just, I don't know. I guess I do, but. It's not too difficult. Um, I mean, these, well, California, I would say it's a little more difficult because, at least in Arizona, you don't even have to register any weapons. You just kind of, you just go by really? and that, you know. Well, well I've first. actually looked into, I've actually looked into handguns um, because I have, like, I have a list of, like, things that I'm really scared of that I'm trying to overcome. Mm-hmm. And that's one of them. And, and being in front of a public crowd is another. And I was shaking when I sang the, the National Anthem. <laughs> there was only, like, 200 people, but I had to hold the mic with both hands because I was shaking. So, actually, I got that from Travis, just trying to push yourself and get out of your comfort zone and, and make yourself uncomfortable and do things that you're scared of. And, and uh, so, I, you know, I've been looking into that. But handguns are expensive, and, you know, it's not really in my price range right now. It's not... Did you then discuss whether or not she, how long it had been before she heard from the victim after she went to Utah, and also how it was that she heard of the victim's death? Yes. Take a look at uh, exhibits 300, which is clip 18, and 297, which is clip, clip 21. Yes. And those contain that por- those portions of the conversation. Yes, that's correct. Look at the admission of exhibits 297 and 300. Yeah. Exhibits 300 and 297 are admitted. Yes, I gave you the one, I apologize. It was the one about um, having, heard, having not heard from the victim in two days is exhibit 298, which is clip number 20. Which, so I would move that one in instead. Any objection? I'm sorry, it sounded like the same one to me. 298, that's what he said. Okay. No objections. 298 is admitted. 
Um, but anyway, what was I saying with that? Um, oh, no, we just discussed, uh, the, you know, the next two days after that you weren't able to get a hold of him. And yeah. And thinking about calling his friends. And trying to yeah, and that's part of the reason I didn't is because I, I knew that I, it just, it didn't feel like my place any longer to be like his mother and, and calling his friends. And so, so you knew him. about his, his trip in, uh, do you remember him telling you when he was, when he was leaving first trip? Yeah, yeah, because we had discussed uh, dates to travel up here. So, um, I asked that he had said that he was leaving the tent. I didn't know how long it would be. I don't know if it was four or five days or six days, uh -huh. but um, I did know that the last we had discussed is his trip up here was going to be after Cancun and before DC, so it'd be sometime toward the end of June, and it would probably be a, a four-day thing for me or a three-day thing. But longer for him because he was traveling along the California coast and then on to Washington. Okay, so he was going to leave the tent, and when was he going to come back? Um, I don't know I exactly. But I know that they're there. Monday night, but it, it was more like, I think it was late Monday night, like 11 something. And uh, he said, hey, how are you doing? I was like, damn, because I had thinking, been thinking about him and I was planning my trip to Arizona and he was definitely on my list of people to visit. I love him and his family. Um, I used to go there every Sunday for dinner. Um, and and I said, hey, how are you doing? He's like, great. And I said, hey, I'm thinking about making a trip out there. And he's like, yeah, I think you're going to have to. Okay. And I was like, yeah, yeah. You know, there was a pause. He's like, and then he's like, yeah. Um, it's, it's just about Travis, and I was like, um, what? You know, like, that's never good. Yeah, but, the way you said that, yeah. Yeah, so, but I didn't think anything at first. I mean, you just kind of, well, okay, what? You know, you don't want to assume too soon. And, and he said, uh, he said they found him. And I was like, what does that mean? Well, I don't know. Well, what do you mean you don't know? What, what, what do you know? Well, I don't really know anything right now. I just know that that Brent Hyatt is at his house and, and Taylor Searle is at his house and that the cops are there. And I was totally shocked. I don't think that I said much. Um, I think that I just, I just kept thinking that I, maybe there's a mistake. Maybe there's a mistake. Are you sure? And he didn't really know, so I kept saying that maybe there was just a mistake because he couldn't say anything. He didn't give me any information, so I thought, he said I was the first person that he thought of to call, but I think he called um, a couple other of uh, leaders in, in Travis's business first that were close yeah. with him. I don't remember who he called or what order, but he called me and uh, I keep thinking that maybe there was, there, that they just made a mistake. And I feel like I felt so helpless because I wasn't there. I still lived there. I was, before I was like 10 minutes away, not even 10, maybe seven minutes away. I could have just driven there, but, and found out and, and saw what was going on. I just felt totally helpless. What did you think about it? I mean, the last time you had talked to him was what? Was it Monday or Wednesday? What was it? I think it was um, Tuesday evening, I think. Yeah, Tuesday night. Yeah. Did you think of, you know, what was going on the last time you talked to him? Did you try to get a hold of him after that? Yeah, yeah, I did. I tried to get a hold of him. Um, I, I called him Tuesday night. Um... I called him subsequently and emailed him um, a couple times. 297 is already in evidence, but is that the one that sent the, the check that was found at the house, as well as whether or not the defendant sent her condolences to the family? Yes. I'm going to the addition of this. Well, I'm sorry, but I'm going to move it. 297 is admitted. I just, I just don't know. Travis was a friend to everybody, and yeah. you know, even when things were bad between us, he was always, he would give his last, he would give his last dollar, his last whatever. He, um, he was telling me he was BMW, and I was actually supposed to email. Yeah, I um, mentioned that, and kind of yeah. burned it out or something. Well, you said he found, you said he found my check in his house. A check. Um, 
Oh, yeah, I check that you gave nope. him for a payment. Yeah. 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 I, mean, um, I guess, like, I... This is so dumb. Like, it seems so unimportant, but I guess I need to know if that check is going to be deposited anytime soon. No, no. Once you, I you know, after his death, it can't be deposited, so... Really? Yeah. It's okay, well, then I'll just consider that uh, whatever, and then, I, and then I'll still owe him the full balance until we figure out what they're going to do. Honestly, I, I trashed his car, and he took it so well. Um, we were trying to figure out between my lawyers and his lawyers and prepaid legal and the insurance and the U-Haul who was going to be held liable. And, you know, it didn't matter who was held liable. The fact was I, that was a debt that I had promised to pay, and it was just money, and it wasn't worth, you know, anything. So, um, I mean, as far as getting any, any contentions over, so um, he was never he never had any doubt that I would pay him back, but he was trying to, and this is what's difficult, is he was trying to um, work with the insurance um, to hold U-Haul accountable. Um, for how it had all gone down. He said the engine just blew up. No, the, no, the vehicle was still in his name, correct? Yeah, he, still the he was going to hold the title until I paid in and the balance in full. Did you guys have like so, a written contract or anything? Or? I had, yeah, what I did is I typed out an email to him and I sent it and um, I just wrote back, just reply, I agree if you agree with this. And he wrote back um, something about you didn't say anything about insurance and so I was like, okay, so I amended that, I think and then wrote back to him. And so that was our agreement. Our agreement was I pay him what I can each month until the balance is paid off. And I, I take care of general maintenance, like oil changes and tires and things like that. I don't know what's going on with, it, with his car or anything. I think it's still at the shop, but uh, his family. I think it's just sitting there collecting dust. Yeah, um, his family's dealing with it because right now it's still considered one of his assets. And it goes, oh. you know, so. Yeah, and I was told, and I should, probably should have done this, but I didn't know who to get a hold of or who was doing what. And I should have asked Dan first, but I emailed his sister to Nisha on MySpace, and I was like, yeah, I just sent her my condolences, and then I, in the next paragraph, was like, you know, it's really hard, but I, I owe Travis this amount of money, and I, I know that at one point I'll need to settle this debt, and, you know, that kind of thing, okay. um, and if you need to be in contact with me about this, my phone number, and, you know, she didn't get back to me, and um, I don't, you know, well, you I, know, I don't. When a death occurs like this, it, you know, everything's got to go to probate anyways. Yeah, and I realize now that there's a, Mike Chapman is the executor of his will, and so I, did get in touch with him yesterday, and he said, um, just give me all the information you have on that matter, and then we'll go from there and decide what's going to happen. Mr. Martinez, we're going to take the evening recess at this time. All right, ladies and gentlemen, tomorrow morning, 1025, please be here. We will start promptly at 1030. Please remember the admonition. Have a nice evening. You are excused. Council 1015 tomorrow in chambers and uh, Deputy Miss Arias here at 1015 tomorrow. All right, thank you.